So distinguish the professors, distinguish the Professor Tong, uh, distinguish the Professor Same and uh, Professor Mao. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Li Tianxiao from Henan Provincial People's Hospital. This meeting is um, guided by WFNS and uh, organized by Henan Provincial People's Hospital and uh, Henan uh, Brain Disease Hospital. So in this uh, meeting, we have gathered the uh, famous experts in the neurosurgery area and talk about the advancement in this area. So on behalf of uh, Henan Provincial People's Hospital, we'd like to say thank you to WFNS. Thank you for providing the platform for us and thank you for your participation. And thank you, dear leaders of um, Henan Provincial People's Hospital. Now let's uh, start the uh, meeting. First of all, this is a uh, video. This is a video for Henan Provincial People's Hospital, Hospital, a short introduction. This is a, a hospital of a more than 100 years history. And it has saved the life of um, thousands and millions of uh, people. So you can see that this is the origin of this hospital. And in 1955, this hospital uh, has uh, become the uh, most uh, powerful comprehensive hospital in this area. In the past 100 years, it has um, uh, achieved a big achievement. So in the 100 years, our hospital uh, integrated the different departments, including neurosurgery, uh, neurology, neurointervention, neuro rehabilitation, radiology, and emergency. And we established a, a specialized hospital, which is Henan Provincial Cerebral Vascular Hospital. So this hospital has the integration of different subdisciplines, and it has become the uh, biggest a uh, regional hospital focusing on the uh, neurovascular diseases. In, 2000 and, uh, in 2017, Professor Yuha joined the uh, Henan Provincial People's Hospital. So this is the start of the journey between us and uh, the uh, famous neurosurgeons across the world. In the past uh, seven years, with the guidance of our governmental departments, we cooperate with um, Harvard University and uh, Mayo Clinics and uh, Minnesota University, Dresden Industrial University, uh, we uh, cooperate with these um, organizations. So we have um, uh, offered the uh, program to uh, train the uh, uh, PhD students and uh, post PhD. And we have um, established a lot of um, uh, projects uh, when we have received a lot of uh, grants from the national government, we have uh, published a lot of um, articles in the high influential journals. You can see that these are the PhD supervisors and the master student supervisors. And here you can see we have um, achieved uh, synchronized development of um, uh, medical practice, education and the scientific research. So the international meeting on neuro-oncology has um, received the uh, attention of the management board. So you can see that this is um, Professor Salim. This is um, uh, Professor Sami uh, from WFNS. This is um, Professor Alama from uh, the Middle East. And this is uh, Professor Victor, the uh, famous anatomic expert. And this is uh, uh, Aziz from UAE. So these experts uh, came to us to talk to us. And this um, a teaching model has been recognized all over the world. And this uh, meeting is um, uh, in cooperation with WFNS. So there is um, a big faculty from WFNS, a very powerful, very luxury, you know, a uh, group of um, experts of uh, WFNS will come to the internet to uh, talk to us. So through this uh, meeting, we can advocate the technology communication. We can share the knowledge, establish the platform. 
and uh, this will be a very important leading platform and to bring benefits for the patients. So I'd like to introduce the uh, VIPs. Professor Tong. Yeah, Professor Sound. Professor Osari. Professor Otto from Japan. Professor Aziz from UAE. Professor Abraham Sabi and also Professor Louis from China and Professor also we have more than 200 and also we have a professor John from the province, so she is the diagnostic uh, department. And also we have from the experts from other departments of our hospital. So let's invite Professor Shao Hongming, the chairman of this meeting, to give us the opening speech. Please, Professor Shao. Distinguished Professor Tong, Professor Sami, and Professor Mao Ying, and the neurosurgeons all over the world. Uh, good afternoon. Today, this is an online and offline meeting together. First of all, on behalf of Henan Provincial People's Hospital, I'd like to extend the welcome and uh, sincere thanks to all the uh, experts throughout the world. Thank you for coming to this uh, meeting, and this is a great commencement. Thank you and welcome. In particular, we'd like to say thank you to WFNS. Thank you for the arranging and the coordinating the program in this meeting. And thank you for the support from the Chinese Neurosurgery Department Association. So this is a very great opportunity that we have from the authorization by WFNS to organize events under the name of WFNS. So this meeting will be live streamed to uh, China and to other countries. And also we have from uh, the media release to other so associations like uh, the European associations and uh, associations in the Africa. Henan Provincial People's Hospital is a, a hospital with 100 years history. We have from one national regional medical center. We have a 17 national training center. And we have from 12 key disciplines. We have from 24 key disciplines of a Henan province. We have a 46 uh, provincial level quality control, diagnosis and treatment. And we have from four uh, Henan provincial medical centers and five clinical study centers. And we have carried out uh, the heart uh, transplantation and heart The business card uh, technologies uh, we can showcase to the whole country. And also, we are the uh, number one throughout the Henan province for continuously three years in terms of um, the performance evaluation. And we are rewarded as the uh, 
advanced uh, organization by uh, the state council because we have uh, done a lot of uh, great jobs uh, during the last edition of Zhongyuan um, European International Forum has received great support by WFNS, including uh, Professor Dandy, uh, Professor Professor Salim and uh, Professor Salim. Uh, so in the last edition of the meeting, uh, more than 10 international experts joining us. And it, this event has become a very famous event among the uh, neurosurgeons in China. So in this meeting to, in this year, we are going to bring you the different aspects, different uh, angles of um, uh, uh, experts from all over the world. They are going to showcase their technology and experience. And also we can uh, show you the development of neurosurgery in China. So we will focus on the, uh, the advance in the glioma treatment and the um, uh, neuro-oncology chapter of uh, WFNS will join the meeting throughout the process. They are going to show the international techniques. They are going to cover the different areas of uh, treating neuro-oncology. So in the recent years, we cooperate with some other organizations throughout the world, like uh, Harvard University, uh, Mayo Clinics, and uh, Germany National Cancer Center. This is my sincere wish that we can uh, uh, continue the cooperation with international neurosurgeons who support our development. I hope that uh, in the future, if you have time, you are more than welcome to come to us and pay a visit. And also, uh, we hope that we can uh, cooperate with the uh, academic organizations. I, uh, we encourage that the uh, young uh, experts could go to the international arena to contribute the uh, uh, knowledge of China to the rest of the world. Finally, I wish the meeting a total sex. I wish everybody a healthy stay in Henan province in this meeting. Thank you so much. event of uh, of me which uh, count is at 56 EWNC Academy virtual activity and my personal activity 1890 I am uh, Dr. Samah El Mousi, co-chairman of uh, World Federation New Oncology Committee. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. I am Dr. Samah El Mousi, co-chairman of uh, World Federation New Surgery, and uh, I, we have uh, started collaboration with uh, Central China since uh, last year, and we have the good uh, collaboration in scientific activity, research activity, and selection of international colleagues to be included in master mm -hmm. and PhD in Hainan Hospital. Building also scientific committees that we have uh, started with uh, Mingli, an international uh, new oncology forum, which uh, I hope all of us and you can join us to develop research and management of patients in China. Our activities is available in medicine, new surgery, forum of China, and also in EWNC Academy. And I'd like to welcome all my speakers and owner administrative of uh, of Henan Hospital and Central China. My uh, gratitude to my chairman of New Oncology Committee, Professor Ton and Professor Kenan for their support to hold up this scientific um, activity. I hope you all can enjoy it, enjoy it and join our Central for, uh, China Forum for New Oncology to develop more and more.
Thank you all. 外科的大力支持。接下来，我们请世界神经外科联合会领导致辞。Now let's welcome Professor Summer to give us an opening speech. Please, Professor Summer. Hi, Professor Sami. Could you give us? Okay. Hello, Sam. You are muted, either. We can't hear you. You are muted. Yeah. Yeah, now we can hear you. And now, we're next. We're going to invite the Chinese Medical Association, the Chinese Medical Association President, the Hwashan Medical Center, Mao Yingyuan. Okay, maybe we can ask Professor Mao to give us the opening speech first. And in this time, we can have to fix the connection. Is there maybe some technical issues? So this is the delivery, uh, delivery of the opening speech by Professor Mao. First of all, please allow me to, on behalf of the uh, uh, Chinese Neurosurgery Association, to give you a uh, sincerest thanks to all the neurosurgeons in this meeting. So WFNS has a very uh, strong faculty in this meeting. I think that uh, the um, experts from the faculty of uh, WFNS will open uh, the window for us and we can talk to each other and improve our standard of practice. So each hospital may have a unique style and they will have different answers. So as far as I know, in this uh, meeting, we have uh, well-known experts from more than 10 countries. They will share cutting edge ideas and achievements with us. I think that this meeting will also bring us an extraordinary brainstorming and also the clash of um, the wisdoms. It is my great pleasure to see that uh, by taking this opportunity, we can uh, further advance the communication between us and the WFNS. We can work together and contribute to the benefit of our human being. World standards need Chinese wisdom. Chinese practice need the world arena. Chinese Medical Association Neurosurgery Chapter will always insist the concept of uh, working with the uh, world and to have a win-win situation with the uh, neurosurgeon peers. Thank you so much, and I wish the meeting a total success. Thank you so much, Professor Mao. Professor Summer, I will try, try to have a speech. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Sami? Yeah.
Yes? Yeah. So, <clears throat> dear, dear Professor Shao, dear Professor Mao, dear esteemed colleagues from China and from all over the world, on behalf of the WFNS Neuro-Oncology Committee, we are very happy and proud to have this meeting today with you all together. Um, the WFNS, the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, is a platform for interaction, communication, and exchange of knowledge. And I think in these days, nothing is more important than communication and cooperation. So we all share a mutual focus, which is the development of neurosurgery, both academically and in the clinical daily work. And it's very important that we have meetings like this, where we can exchange not only our data, but also our perspectives. And by doing so and working together on a common subject, we all build a huge international faculty and a huge international communicate, community working together and speaking together. And I think this is a role model for all over the world. So let's embark on these tasks today. I'm very happy and I'm very grateful to my co-chair, Summer uh, of the WFNS Neuro-Oncology Committee. So um, Sami has well been very industrial and very important in setting up the program here. So thanks again. Thanks for all my colleagues of the Neuro-Oncology Committee sharing us and, and being with us today. And I wish the whole meeting a very big success. Thank you so much for having us here. So this is the end of the opening uh, speech. So Professor Summer, please uh, moderate this session. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so can you see my screen? Okay, so dear colleagues, it's a pleasure and honor to present this work of, on behalf of the RANO Resect Consortium, which is being listed here, which has recently been published and looking for a classification of extent of resection in glioblastoma. So this is my declaration of conflict of interest in terms of uh, cooperation with industry. Nothing is related to the talk today. So surgical resection of glioma, there are several dif definitions. And as you can see here on this um, slide, even with the definition of gross total resection or subtotal resection, there's a huge variation of what people who conducted large um, studies understand as being a gross total resection. Some of them say it's 100% removal of contrast enhancing tumor. Others claim 90% of the contrast enhancing volume being removed already a gross total resection. And even this definition of subtotal resection differs much more. So between 80% and 40% of contrast enhancing tumor being removed has been claimed as subtotal resection in large studies, even in the recent years. And there is no real good information about the role of absolute residual tumor being left in or else the importance of the volume of the non-contrast enhancing tumor in glioblastoma. So this is a very seminal work of uh, Annette Molinaro from San Francisco being published in the JAMA in 2020, where she had a nomogram of extent of resection, but being the relative re 
amount of tissue being removed. And as you can see here, between removal of 40 and 80 percent of the contrast enhancing mass, there's basically no difference in the likelihood or in the risk of to die from this disease. So when you remove more than 80% of the tumor, obviously you did a good job. If it's less than 40%, it is even worse. And in between 40 and 80%, no change. So what does this mean in practice? So if you have a tumor like this one, which is around about 60 cubic centimeters large preoperatively, you remove the tumor, there's some tumor remnant left here because it's close to the white matter tracts and the residual tumor volume is five cubic centimeter. That means you have a remnant of 9% in volumetric analysis or else a resection of 91% of the contrast enhancing volume. And just a short note, I think in the future we have to concentrate on volumetric analysis. Anything else is at best an educated guess, but we need strong data and strong data is volumetry. So if you have this resection being done with 90% of tumor being resected, then you are very right, much on the right side of this normogram. And this will show this is a pretty good resection. However, if you assume the initial volume of the tumor would have been 15 cubic centimeter, then it's only 34% um, being left in, and this is a uh, rather bad um, removal. So it is more important what is left behind than what is taken out, because from an oncological perspective, it is more important the amount of tumor which is being left in the patient and which has to be dealt with with the um, subsequent therapy. So this was a proposed nomenclature for extent of resection we um, published in 2021, where partial resection is being termed more than five cubic centimeter residual tumor being left in. Subtotal resection is less than five cubic of residual contrast enhancing tumor. Near total resection is less than one cubic centimeter of residual contrast enhancing tumor and complete resection is no residual contrast enhancing tumor. So whenever there's some residual contrast enhancement, this can't be complete resection. And if you look for the evidence level, all these evidences here are very low. It's class four evidence. Only the complete resection had been analyzed in a couple of studies on evidence level grade two. And even more so there, role of supramaximal resection, which means resection beyond the borders of the enhancing tumor um, volume remains to be defined. So if you have an example like this one, this is a patient with a contrast enhancing tumor mass of 2.9 cubic centimeters and the non-contrast enhancing tumor, which you can delineate from the flare or T2 signal here is uh, 3.5 nine, so roughly four cubic centimeters. So even if you would have resected the contrast enhancing mass, you still would have left in more than 50% of the whole tumor volume. And this underlines the importance of the non-contrast enhancing tumor volume. So we embarked on a, a consortium, which we call under the umbrella of the RANO group, the RANO resect um, um, cohort, with the current aims of prognostically validate the classification system we proposed for extent of resection across multiple centers and to determine prognostic cutoff values for resection of non-contrast enhancing tumor, which we felt is might maybe even imp as important as the contrast enhancing one, and to provide a validated uniform nomenclature for prospective clinical trials. Please remember all the previous nomenclatures had not been validated yet. So what we did is we um, collected over 1,000 tumors being molecularly defined as a glioblastoma from these seven centers. And these are the um, patient data here. And you can see that the complete resection, which means no contrast enhancing left, was achieved in 50% of the patients with um, a near total 
resection in another 15%, in 20% subtotal resection, and partial resection in 10%. And if you now look at the data, you can see that out of these 1,021 patients, we could analyze 744 patients being molecularly defined, having all the imaging you need to do volumetric analysis, which means a total set of pre and immediate post-op MRIs. And if it comes to survival curves, you see that partial resection and subtotal resection didn't dif differ at all. This is no statistically significant difference. You see that it is uh, median overall survival 16 versus 16 months. And it has to be stressed and emphasized. All these patients had undergone the same post-op treatment. So all of these patients underwent the so-called EORTC or STUP protocol with radiochemotherapy. So the post-op therapy was similar in all these patients. So if the only difference was between near total com uh, contrast enhancing resection and the complete resection of contrast enhancing volume with the mean overall survival between 20 and 17 months. So in other words, when you have complete resection of the contrast enhancing volume, which is the blue curve here, median overall survival 20 months. If you have near total 70 months, which is similar to the 16 months of the partial and subtotal resection, summing up in only complete resection of the contrast enhancing volume matters in a substantial way. But we then went a step further and wanted to know what is about the non-contrast enhancing tumor resection. So again, out of these 744 IDH wild type glioblastomas being treated with the EORTC protocol, we had 356 glioblastomas who underwent at least complete resection of the contrast enhancing volume. So these we could analyze for the additional volume for supramaximal um, resection. And it turned out there is a threshold for overall survival talking about the residual non-contrast enhancing volume. And this threshold is five cubic centimeters. So if you have less than five cubic centimeter of non-contrast enhancing volume being left with no contrast enhancing tumor again, then you have a difference in survival. And this is turns out to be the case in progression-free, but even more so in overall survival. So over, me, median overall survival was 29 months in patients undergoing a supra-maximal resection compared to 20 months of uh, the so-called complete resection. So then we summed up and we um, created a four-tire classification of resection, which to make a things more simple, says that class, class one is less than five cubic non-contrast enhancing tumor and no contrast enhancing tumor being left over. Class two is uh, less than five, one centimeter contrast enhancing tumor and class three is more than one cubic centimeter contrast enhancing tumor being left over. And these four tire classification separates in overall survival and progression free survival very nicely the three, the four different curves in a highly significant way. So to conclude the run of categories of extent of resection, um, they show that the post-op tumor volume is more relevant than the relative tumor reduction, that supramaximal resection conveys into a prognostic benefit and should be denominated as such, that individual RANO classes reflect the different post-op tumor volumes, and this is uh, mirrored by different um, outcomes, and the prognostic value of these um, remaining tumor mass is independent of clinical molecular markers. So it was the same for the MGMT methylated and non-methylated tumors. And the RANO reset categories may thus serve for stratification and overall design of clinical trials. And we are now looking currently into the re-resection, so into the first resection after 
um, a recurrent uh, a recurrence of the tumor. And again, it turns out that the hazard ratio for death after first recurrence um, is closely rel related to the post-op tumor volume being left in after re-resection. And this turns out in a very nice separation between the complete resection of all contrast enhancing and non-contrast enhancing mass uh, compared to the no leftover of some contrast enhancing residual tumor. And this is true for the methylated and the non-methylated um, patients. So to sum up, obviously extent of resection matters, but it matters in terms of what you leave in. And with this, I would like to thank the RANU Resect investigators, and I'm happy to discuss it later on in this meeting. Thank you so much. So we are all familiar with the standard of uh, uh, care when uh, dealing with a newly diagnosed glioblastoma. We start from a tumor resection, aiming for gross total resection if possible. And if not, we perform only biopsy following by uh, radiation therapy and uh, temozolomide. And uh, over the past uh, few years, we also uh, started to treat with a tumor treating field. Um, I will not get into the definition of what is a uh, tumor recurrence in the case of uh, glioblastoma and the uh, differential diagnosis with the pseudo progression, uh, because I don't think it's uh, in the scope of uh, uh, this talk, but um, we're all uh, familiar with the fact that uh, the recurrence usually appear uh, up to one year after the initial uh, diagnosis. And uh, the recurrence can be symptomatic um, or just uh, uh, diagnosed by a follow up uh, MRI. Oh, hello, hello. Pro Professor Grossman. Can you enlarge yeah. your screen? Uh, hi, Sorry. Prof. You're, you uh, your you're, you're not in the full screen mode. Can you, can you enlarge this, your slide? Uh, doctor, hi, Dr. Rachel. Your slide is not in full screen. Your slide is not in full screen. Could you put it to full screen? Uh, not it. Yes. Sorry? Press F5 in your computer to get the full screen. Uh, I think it's in the full screen. No, not like full screen. Screen. no it's you can not stop. Rachel. Yeah. You have, you have to enlarge into the presentation mode. So if you can do it either by going on the lower left corner. Yes, no, more, this one, yes, please. Now it should, should switch over. Do you see it? Uh, we see it not full screen, we see it with the, with the small, um, small, slides on the left side and the medium size in the center. So it's not the presentation mode, actually. Um, yes, that's it. That's it? Thank you, thank you. Yes, that's the... It was okay. It Please was okay, it. now it's gone. So... This is okay? No. No, okay. I will try just one moment. Presentation mode. Yeah. Yes, it's okay now. Please All right. go ahead. All right. So um, there is no standard of care when we're dealing uh, with a uh, tumor recurrence. 
so the treatment option, including uh, another uh, radiation uh, uh, session of the tumor, uh, another surgery. Uh, sometimes we prefer to give uh, bevacizumab or another line of uh, alkylating uh, agent, or sometimes uh, uh, we give the uh, patient the opportunity to participate to uh, a clinical uh, trial. So uh, we face a lot, a lot of uh, skepticism uh, about the um, value of uh, surgical resection in the case of uh, GPM recurrence. And this is mostly because uh, the patient have a smaller functional and uh, cognitive uh, reserve. And usually the tumor uh, that we carved uh, infiltrate into the functional uh, eloquent uh, region in the brain. And uh, actually uh, resection is not uh, really possible. And also the oncological benefit of uh, such a resection uh, is always uh, a question. So what is the right strategy? Uh, probably a repeat uh, surgery uh, is reserved for patients in a good functional status, um, young patient uh, with a um, good uh, prognostic factor, which have um, a large tumor uh, with mass effect. Uh, those are symptomatics for this uh, uh, mass effect. Uh, those probably will be uh, our candidate for uh, another uh, resection of uh, the tumor. And we need to remember that there are several uh, patterns of uh, progression when we're talking about uh, glioblastoma recurrence. Most of, most of the GBM patient uh, will uh, experience uh, local recurrence of the tumor, about 75% uh, of the uh, patient uh, population. Uh, but the other uh, patient uh, probably will suffer from uh, uh, other kind of uh, recurrence, a uh, multifocal recurrence, uh, which is usually uh, more than uh, two lesions uh, of uh, recurrence. Uh, sometimes they will suffer from a uh, distant uh, tumor recurrence when there is no continuation between the primary tumor site and the recurrent tumor. Uh, on the right side, you can see uh, the leptomeningeal dissemination. It's not a 2T, T, T, uh, T2 image, it's a, it's a T1 uh, after gadolinium uh, inject, and, and you see a massive uh, leptomeningeal uh, spread of the tumor. Um, this is, is a very um, interesting publication uh, from uh, three years ago in uh, neuro-oncology. Uh, they talk about um, the um, recurrent uh, uh, pattern uh, nowadays. Uh, actually, it's based on the post-mortem uh, brain of a GBM patient uh, and the change uh, over time in the progression uh, pattern. Uh, it showed that uh, nowadays, most of the patients with recurrence, they probably will have a uh, more extensive uh, dissemination of the uh, tumor cell into the brainstem. While in the past, uh, usually uh, the patients suffer from a uh, herniation and a uh, more uh, mass effect. Um, overall, up to 25% of uh, patients with a uh, recurrent glioblastoma probably will be considered for a uh, repeat surgery. Other patients uh, with diffuse or deep-seated uh, lesion or uh, sometimes uh, with no symptoms, just uh, radiological uh, progression will not be uh, our uh, candidate for uh, another uh, session of surgery. So <clears throat> I present uh, several patterns of uh, tumor uh, recurrence and those in green are probably our uh, well-confined uh, recurrent uh, tumor that will be a good candidate for uh, another surgery. With those in red, uh, probably has a diffuse uh, disease uh, with uh, massive uh, involvement of the uh, Sylvian uh, uh, fissure uh, and will not be a good candidate for uh, surgery. Um, we try to understand and to assess uh, the impact of surgery uh, for recurrent uh, glioblastoma. Uh, and there is a couple of uh, uh, retrospective uh, analyses uh, but we know that there is no uh, consensus because the uh, number of studies reported uh, increase overall survival with repeat surgery. Uh, but uh, other surgery just show uh, increased uh, complication rate without any survival uh, benefit. Uh, I must say that all of these uh, presented uh, studies are uh, respective uh, analysis. Uh, the only prospective randomized multicenter study assessed the association between uh, um, <clears throat> the clinical outcome of uh, surgery uh, for recurrent uh, glioblastoma um, um, was uh, the directory study, and they showed that surgery for uh, first recurrence uh, actually improved the survival 
uh, in case of a gross total uh, resection of all the contrast uh, enhancing uh, tumor. And this was especially true for uh, those with a, a good uh, uh, prognostic factors, such as the young age or smaller tumor or good functional uh, status. I just want to mention um, some technical issues uh, associated with the uh, recurrent uh, surgery. Uh, one of them, uh, for me, it's very crucial, is the adhesion uh, issues. Uh, when we operate a recurrent case, we uh, need to be prepared for a adhesion between the dura uh, and the cortex. Uh, and usually we can cause a actually cortical uh, injury. Uh, and if we want to uh, place the cortical strip uh, electrode, sometimes it will, it will not be possible because of uh, uh, the adhesion. So um, I personally uh, use um, in uh, primary cases of uh, glioma, when I know that uh, there is a chance that I will return uh, to operate this patient uh, for the second case, I use a dual substitute uh, with a polyester uh, urethane, uh, which uh, keep the plane, the surgical plane between uh, the dura and the cortex. Uh, so uh, uh, it uh, make it easier uh, for the recurrent uh, cases. Um, just um, a brief reminder about uh, another uh, um, surgical uh, uh, and treatment modality, uh, the gliadel wafers that uh, can be placed uh, in recurrent cases after uh, we resect the tumor and the Lancet study uh, published uh, 30 years ago showed uh, eight years, uh, eight uh, weeks of uh, survival uh, benefit. Um, so this is a, a case of a recurrent uh, glioblastoma. Um, it's a 40 years old uh, male um, who was operated for a left parietal uh, glioblastoma. Um, later on, he received uh, the stood protocol for radiation therapy with the temozolomide. Uh, and uh, later on, he developed uh, this uh, left parietal uh, recurrent uh, tumor. Uh, we thought that he is a very good uh, candidate for a uh, revisection of the tumor because he was in a very good uh, functional status. And the recurrence pattern was uh, really confined to the left uh, parietal region. Uh, and because of the um, exact tumor location, uh, we choose to operate the patient uh, via awake uh, craniotomy and to monitor for language and for a uh, a motor uh, function. Um, the tumor is really adjacent uh, to the motor uh, strip. So uh, we perform uh, the cortical uh, mapping. And here we actually uh, enter uh, to the tumor through the previous uh, corticotomy. Uh, we use the probe uh, to perform a subcortical uh, monitoring during uh, and before uh, the tumor resection. Um, <clears throat> we use the UV light uh, for the 5ALA, uh, and this actually uh, will be uh, the tissue that we aim to resect for a gross total resection, if possible. And then we use the electrified CUSA. Uh, uh, that uh, show us constantly uh, the distance between uh, the tip of the CUSA and the cortical uh, spinal tract. And then in the end, we place uh, the uh, VCNU wafers. or a gross total resection of the tumor. So <clears throat> I will uh, present uh, two cases of uh, real life uh, scenarios. Uh, I will start with the case of a 65 years old male who present uh, with the dysphysia and we operate um, uh, under a awake craniotomy uh, 
actually it was in 2019, uh, this uh, left temporal parietal uh, glioblastoma. Uh, he received uh, the STUP uh, protocol uh, following by uh, eight cycles of uh, temozolomide. He also uh, uh, received the tumor treating field. And then uh, two and a half years later on, uh, this uh, right lesion on the contralateral side show up. Uh, and uh, we had a dilemma, what is the right thing to do? Uh, we decided eventually to take out uh, this uh, lesion uh, as well. Uh, and I just want to mention briefly this uh, interesting phenomena of a distal uh, recurrent uh, associated with uh, treating with a tumor treating field that became uh, more and more uh, uh, apparent. And you can see in this uh, publication, uh, it's actually based on the analysis of the EF14, uh, that showed that uh, distant recurrent uh, of the tumor was more common in the uh, TD field uh, group compared to the uh, control group. And actually, and I don't really know the reason, but uh, the distal progression was associated with a better clinical uh, outcome. So this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, another case, um, it's a um, case of a um, 60 years old uh, female who underwent a resection of uh, this uh, right uh, frontal uh, glioblastoma following by radiation therapy and temozolomide. And later on, she show, us, uh, show up with uh, this uh, uh, small, tiny recurrent in the right temporal stem. And um, we had a discussion, what is the right thing to do, whether to take it out by a uh, resection or to uh, perform a focal radiation, or to give her a systemic uh, uh, treatment with uh, bevacizumab. Uh, but uh, finally, we decided uh, to give her uh, the laser uh, ablation, uh, DELETE, uh, which is relatively a new surgical uh, modality based on the heat uh, delivering probe guided by uh, MRI thermometry uh, that based on the hyperthermic uh, injury into the brain uh, parenchyma, and the monitor of the ablation uh, temperature is done um, by real-time uh, MRI uh, thermometry. And um, um, you can see on the right side um, the catheter, which is located uh, in the middle of uh, the target, middle of the lesion. Uh, and on the left side, you can see the thermal uh, MRI map uh, the show as the ablation uh, process. Um, I, I must say that um, still it's not completely clear um, what is the efficacy uh, of this treatment modality when we are uh, dealing with uh, recurrent uh, glioma, but it definitely can be uh, a potential treatment option uh, for a deep-seated uh, um, lesion uh, such as uh, this uh, scenario. And uh, this is the uh, MRI, uh, one month uh, post uh, laser ablation. You can uh, clearly see uh, the area of the ablation uh, on the uh, right side. So um, for conclusion, um, we can say that the appropriate management uh, for patients with recurrent glioblastoma uh, requires the uh, individualization uh, based on the uh, patient parameters and also uh, the type and the pattern of the uh, recurrence whether it's a local or a diffuse. And the oncological benefit of a revisection need to be balanced against the complication rate of a repeat surgery. And overall, surgery for selected group of patients with recurrent glioblastoma uh, may lead to improved survival. So I will stop here uh, and I would like to thank you and uh, we'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Rashil, for uh, this excellent presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists or from uh, audience? Thank you. And now uh, we will shift to uh, next speaker, Professor Abida Shah. For giving me this opportunity to present here. And I'm going to be talking on a little different topic in the sense we don't generally operate on corpus callosal gliomas. For all many years, we've just been shunning away from this surgery, taking a biopsy, you know, worried about disconnection. And that's why we don't generally perform a radical surgery for corpus callosal gliomas. But I'm just going to 
refresh uh, anatomical understanding and how we have now changed our surgical strategy for corpus callosal gliomas. So the corpus callosum is the biggest commissure of the brain. The other commissura, commissura means when two adjoining parts or a union of two adjoining parts as they come together. So in the brain, they occur in the corpus callosum. Then you see the anterior commissure, the hippocampal commissure where both the fornices come together. Here you have in the back, the posterior commissure just beneath the pineal body. And of course, you have the massa intermedia, which is not a true commissure, but I've just shown it here that how the two thalami also unite at this, this region. So the corpus callosum is a distinct modification in placental mammals. Before placental mammals, the, everything, the, all the transformation, all the information was transmitted across the hemispheres by means of the anterior commissure. The anterior commissure used to be very thick. It is only in placental mammals because the reason the corpus callosum developed is to shorten the time of transmission. See, if you look at the anterior commissure anatomy, it goes all the way to the temporal lobes. Whereas the corpus callosum significantly shortens the distance between the two hemispheres. It increases the speed of transmission and thus it increases the effectiveness of it. So this is our paper on the subject of white fibers, where we've analyzed the architecture and function of all the white fibers of the brain. And based on our analysis, we divide the white fibers of the brain into four horizontal layers and one vertical layer. So the four horizontal layers are, this is the first one, the superficial group or the short association fibers, this yellow circle here. The second one is the middle group that you see here, the blue circle, and it comprises of all the long association fibers, the SLF, the AF, the uncinate, the middle longitudinal fasciculus, and all those fibers. Then the third group is the deep group, which goes in relation to the ventricles and consists of the fornix, the stria terminalis, the stria medullaris, thalami, and the medial and lateral longitudinal stri. And then the last group is the commissural group or the central group, and which is the subject of this presentation today which comprises of the corpus callosum, the anterior and the posterior commissures, the habitudinal commissure and the hippocampal commissure. A very important thing to notice about these commissural group is they're right in the midline. They are bordered laterally by this vertical layer, which is the fifth layer here, or the group of projection fibers, which comprises of the internal capsule and the thalamic radiations. So corpus callosum is confined within the boundaries of these vertical fibers laterally, and so that gives you an insight on how these gliomas will grow, as I will show you in my later slides. So looking at the anatomy of the corpus callosum itself, we all know that it is divided into the rostrum, the genu, the body, the isthmus, and the splenium. This is a tractographic and MRI fused image. And here you can see the fibers of the corpus callosum. You can see how the fibers of the corpus callosum are bordered here by the internal capsule. They, you know, the forceps minor going anteriorly, the forceps major going posteriorly, and the corpus callosum actually envelopes the whole ventricular system. So if you look at this, this transparent structures that you see here is the lateral ventricle here, the third ventricle going into the aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. So the corpus callosum actually envelopes the whole ventricle within its boundaries. And I will show you some anatomical pictures to show that. And this is one of our recent publications on the corpus callosum and its connections, and all the connections of the corpus callosum are displayed in this paper. So it is very interesting to know that the corpus callosum connects the entire right hemisphere to the entire left hemisphere. And we will see each of these connections. So this is an overview with a superior view of the corpus callosum. So if you see laterally here, this is the corona radiata going down as it becomes the internal capsule. So this is what I meant was, that the corpus callosal fibers are bordered by the vertical group of fibers here. Looking at it from a lateral perspective. So what we have done is we've divided corpus callosal radiations into dorsal, ventral, anterior, and posterior callosal radiations. So if you look at these, these are fibers that come transversely and then curve superiorly. These are the dorsal callosal radiations and they connect the frontal and the parietal lobes more importantly, the motor, the supplementary motor area to each other. Then these are the forceps minor, or as I have called them, the anterior callosal radiation, and they connect the medial frontal lobes of each hemisphere to each other. Posteriorly, again, you have the forceps major, or the fibers that connect the occipital lobes to each other, or the posterior callosal radiations. 
So these are the three types that we are very familiar with. There is another group, the ventral callosal radiations, which we don't generally refer to. And again, the ventral callosal radiations are divided into two, the anterior ventral callosal radiations and the posterior ventral callosal radiations. So these fibers actually run transversely and then curve downwards instead of going anteriorly or superiorly, and they connect. The anterior ventral callosal radiation connect the basal ganglia of one hemisphere to the other side, and the posterior ventral callosal radiations actually connect the temporal lobes to each other by means of the tapetum. So if you see these fibers that form the roof of the roof and lateral wall of the temporal and horn and the atrium are the fibers of the tapetum. Here you can see them more clearly. So these are the anterior ventral callosal radiations as they're connecting to the basal ganglia, and these are fibers of the tapetum. Here you can see how it is forming the roof of the body of the lateral ventricle, the atrium, and the temporal horn. So as I said, the corpus callosum actually envelopes the whole ventricle within its radiation. Looking closely, these are the anterior callosal radiations or the forceps minor. You can see them beautifully here curving. And this, again, posteriorly, this whole bulk that forms a prominence in the ventricle here, as we are all aware of, forms the forceps major. Now, inferiorly, the genu and the rostrum, you see how beautiful this is. There are fibers that come here from the genu and the rostrum, and they run along here with the fibers of the temporal stem, the fibers of the IFOF, and again, help in connect the, connecting the temporal lobes to each other. So this is the inferior part of the anterior ventral callosal radiations as they connect the temporal lobes to each other. So this is how the network of the corpus callosum is. Here you can see these fibers more clearly. Here you can see them originating from here and going all the way, running along with the IFOF and going into the temporal lobe. So the network of the corpus callosum connects the whole brain, right brain to the left brain. And here you see in different color schemes, the purple one are the dorsal callosal radiations, the orange one are the anterior callosal radiations, the yellow one are the posterior ones. The pink one is the tapetum, and these are the anterior ventral callosal radiations. You see how closely communicating they are with the fibers of the IFOF. The blue one that you see here is the IFOF. Another important thing, I'll just digress a little. When you're performing a callosotomy, there are two important points. You perform a callosotomy in a transverse direction so that you do not split the fibers. You will just split the fibers. You will not cut the fibers when you're entering the corpus callosum. And these rectangles that you see here, are safe areas for actually entering because here you're going into the isthmus of the corpus callosum, thus avoiding the forceps major. And here go, you're going in the genu and the anterior part of the body, again, without causing too much of a deficit. Now, this area is a complete no-no. This is the area that connects the SMA and the motor area of one hemisphere to the other. So you absolutely avoid this area when performing a callosotomy. On the other hand, when you're doing a callosotomy for a disconnection or for an epilepsy surgery, you make sure that you include this portion, otherwise the patient will keep continuing to have epilepsy. Now, on this backdrop, I will now go into how to understand surgery for corpus callosal gliomas. So this is our recent concept that despite them being aggressive, infiltrative, invasive, gliomas are surgically confined. They arise from a named white fiber tract and they grow along that named white fiber tract. And we published this radiological evaluation of this anatomical extensions of glioma. And this gives you a very beautiful, if you understand the anatomy of the white fibers and correlate it with the radiology, you will get a beautiful insight on how to approach the tumors. So based on this, we divide gliomas into two types, localized and diffuse. So the localized group is the one that arises from the short arcuate fibers. They generally remain localized to a gyrus. These are the ones that we commonly see and commonly are able to resect by an N mass resection strategy. The second one is the diffuse type. They are again those that arise from the long association fibers. So many a times you see this pattern that the tumor is arising above the corpus callosum and going up towards the parietal lobe. It's actually a glioma that is growing along and involving the cingulum. This is one diffuse type. And the other one are the tumors of the commissural fibers or more commonly the corpus callosum. Most of these tumors go bilaterally. And this is a very important distinguishing factor that distinguishes them from other tumors of the other types of gliomas. So for tumors that arise from the short arcuate fibers or for low grade, uh, the tumors that are localized, we advocate an n mass tumor resection strategy. Now let's look at some corpus callosal gliomas. So you look at this pattern of spread. So this is the anatomy of the corpus callosum. You see how these 
tumor is going. It is going along the dorsal callosal radiations. If you see, you will see that it is bordered laterally. It does not cross over to this line. There is a boundary of the vertical group that is preventing them from tracking laterally. So they are growing along the dorsal callosal radiations. There's another one. Here you can see them very clearly. It is there in the body of the corpus callosum, going bilaterally, going along the superior, uh, along the dorsal callosal radiation. This is the one that is going along the ventral callosal radiation. This is important to recognize. This is just a corpus callosal tumor. It is growing on the ventral callosal radiations and going laterally and downwards. This is a tumor that is practically involving all the fibers of the corpus callosum, again going bilaterally and tracking along the fiber tracks. Now look at this one. This is nothing but the tumor of the corpus callosum. How? Because it is tracking, you can look here. It is looking tracking along the roof and lateral wall of the corpus callosum. That is, it is tracking along the tapetum. And there's another tumor of the corpus callosum and you have to recognize this fact so that you can operate on them. How do you differentiate them from singular tumors? So this, you can look at this tumor. It is not going bilaterally. It is confined to one hemisphere. You can see that the corpus callosum is pushed down and this is a tumor of the isthmus of the cingulum. There's another tumor that is of the, it's going bilaterally that involves the genua of the corpus callosum and going involving the forceps minor going into the bilateral medial frontal lobes. And this one, which looks quite bizarre, is actually involving multiple fiber radiations of the corpus callosum. So you see these fibers that are going, the dorsal callosal radiations are involved, and here the ventral callosal radiations are involved. So it is not a multicentric tumor. It is actually a tumor that is involving different components of the radiations of the corpus callosum. Again, the tractographic image showing how the vertical group of fibers is preserved. The fibre tumor is not going beyond that. And beautifully, it can be approached by an interhemispheric approach, which we did. And you can see the quite radical resection that we have achieved. This is a tumor of the forceps minor, which I recently operated. And you can see that I went in from one side and performed a good radical resection of the tumor. And the patient did not have any major disconnection problems. And he did well following the surgery. The follow-up is of three years and he's still doing well. This is again another tumor that is involving the forceps minor. And actually, this is a very bizarre tumor because on one side, it is involving the forceps minor. On the other side, it is actually going to the ventral callosal radiation. I actually performed two craniotomies on this patient on bilaterally and went ahead and resected the tumor and the patient is doing well. This is a tumor involving the splenium or the forceps major going bilaterally into the medial occipital regions. Little difficult to resect the tumors of the splenium completely because of the risk of disconnection. And here you see that still I have performed quite a radical resection on this side, leaving some tumor on this side back. And this patient is also done well following the surgery. This is again another tumor of the forceps minor going bilaterally. I've approached it from one side and removed a maximum bulk of the tumor with something left behind because I could not reach it from this side. This patient is being observed and is undergoing radiotherapy. So basically my message to you is that corpus callosal tumors can be approached surgically and can be radically resected. And to approach these tumors, you have to first understand the anatomy of the corpus callosum, and that helps you design a good surgical strategy for these tumors. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Abida, for uh, this excellent presentation and the new concept is that you have worked in my, our mind. That's why uh, I, a lot of questions in... Uh... Yes, okay. go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to congratulate um, Same and the team for um, conducting this a very informative and educative uh, session. And I think, I believe that this will help us uh, all neurosurgeons around the world to share uh, easier um, and make us learn easier. So I think compared to other speaker, my talk will be very pretty basic and hopefully everyone um, can have this as the reminder, as a basic uh, awake craniotomy. So my name is Alfio Swari. I'm currently working at Indonesia National Brain Center and also faculty at University Department, Universitas Pajajaran, Bandung, uh, Indonesia. So this is um, our case in 2020 to 2022. We have 86 awake craniotomy. Um, and because of Indonesia is um, um, uh, a country that full of islands, we have actually 17,000 islands on so, and our referral uh, center is in the 
capital in Jakarta here. So most of our patients actually coming from our surroundings area, but it can also come from a very, very far away island. And compared to all these islands, um, the center that are doing awake craniotomy, the highest number is in our centers. And there are only other one or two other centers that doing the awake craniotomy. And I believe that um, maybe it's because of lack of um, um, facility or maybe lack of um, belief in uh, awake craniotomy. So here is the pathology. Uh, from 2020 to 2021 and also 2022, we uh, split this because of the new uh, gradings. And as we can find in the literature, 35% is GBM and the other part is the uh, low-grade gliomas. And we take care mostly uh, patients from 19 to 65, only small percentage uh, children or uh, more than 65 which actually this is also a very nice discussion later on uh, because in awake craniotomy, as we know from observation that uh, in male with a uh, young age, uh, in our observation, they have higher anxiety level compared to female, uh, especially in older uh, age of female. And most of our uh, glioma patient underwent a craniotomy tumor removal and only 19% of it uh, underwent the awake craniotomy. So as an overview, this is the very basic one. So I would like to talk a little bit about the history and why doing it awake and how is the anesthesia perspective and the protocol and also sharing some cases. So in the very beginning, it was introduced by Penfield and then also Roberts and Ogeman that uh, saying that awake craniotomy is an effective technique for cortical language mapping. And it was done previously to excise the epileptogenic foci and also the tumors affecting the functional eloquent cortex. Of course, nowadays we have more advanced neuro navigational tools, but uh, can it replace awake craniotomy? As we know that all these neuro navigational tools that we have uh, currently now, um, of course, um, we are not talking about the interpretive MRI, but other neuro navigational tools, it's all not the real time. Um, and um, we also will talk about the novel anesthetic protocols. And why awake? Because we know that in glioma surgery, we are aiming for the maximizing uh, safe resection and brain mapping actually can help us to achieve uh, this uh, maximized uh, safe resection. As an intuitive, it will, it's also causing the lower morbidity and in minimized resources country, uh, like our country, it actually can be very helpful because we only need uh, a very low amount that a patient that goes to intensive care and also the overall length of stay is shorter. And this patient perception study, it's 90% well correlated satisfaction. One fourth does not really remember, 8% uh, experience, experience pain, 12% saying that they have discomfort and fear 15%. Uh, it's safer for the patient with a lower complication rate because we can avoid general anesthesia and also it's cost effective. And it's becoming preferable for supratentoral tumors and to, uh, we can also understand the tumor associated the neuronal plasticity. Um, from the anesthesia perspective, uh, the risk is lower compared to general anesthesia, and we can convert it to general anesthesia anytime when you use the nasal cannula. And for the head frame, we are using the titrated midazolam, propofol, and fentanyl. Um, and from the paper uh, 2016, comparing the dexmethamidin versus the propofol remifentanil, it showed that dexmethamidin effect similar to propofol and remifentanil uh, with fewer respiratory adverse events. So we are trying to use as much as possible the dexmethamidin, but if we cannot find it um, because of um, the resources, so then we will change to propofol and remifentanil. And the complication, it can be anesthesia related uh, because of the hemodynamic changes, the hypertension, tachycardia, and it's surgically induced 5.0% uh, from the paper in 2012 from Bernstein, Toronto. It showed seizures uh, that can be resolved by cold cortical irrigation. And it has two conversion to general anesthesia. Uh, and it depends on the patient's specific comorbidities. Uh, why uh, we are doing the awake craniotomy. So 
as I mentioned before, to improve resection volumes and allow surgical treatments, otherwise inoperable tumors, and also improving the healthcare resource utilization. Facilitate access to neurosurgical care in very low resource settings. And we, we are also, of course, aiming for high satisfaction a patient rate. So it's an effective and versatile neurosurgical procedure with expanding application in neuro-oncology. Uh, for patient selection from this paper, uh, it suggested more than 11 years old. The youngest that was um, presented in this paper is nine years old. It depends on the patient capacity and cooperation and the significant comorbidities uh, should also uh, be in our mind before surgery. We should check if there's any sleep apnea, difficult airway or severe obesity and also informed consent because some patients, um, they don't want to be involved because they are very afraid uh, in surgery and they want to put the sleep right away. So that's also a difficulty, especially in our country, trying to explain the patient that this will actually help uh, extending the maximal safety section by having their cooperation during surgery. And the tumor location, we have to put in mind the patient's and surgeon comfort position, and not suggested for prone position, of course, expected difficulty tumor resection. Um, for example, the highly vascular tumors that can uh, makes it difficult to have the patient awake. awake. Um, so what we are using is 2% lidocaine with 1 um, to 200,000 epinephrine for regional field block around incision, only around incision. And um, we're using the propofloran fentanyl or dexmethamidine, depends on the availability. And we're using the direct cortical stimulation with the bipolar stimulation, six to 10, and with 100 microseconds square, 50 hertz. And then we are using the, of course, the cortical mapping. Uh, we think that this is simple and less impassive. Um, for the motor, we will test the strength testing. Um, we use the EMG with subdermal needle electrodes. So we, uh, all the time, we have our neurologist um, monitoring uh, for the intraoperative monitoring. We also have our neurologist in the neuro behavior division that will access uh, the patient's speech and also the other function, even the higher cortical function. And for sensory motor, uh, we check about the movement of the face, arm or leg, alters, or is there any alter sensation during the movement? And the language, we're using the microphone and then the semantic processing task. Um, we are currently doesn't have neuropsychiatry, but it's a good idea to have a neuropsychiatry uh, in the room if it's available. And incident of permanent post of deficit, uh, resection distance from eloquent cortex more than one centimeters. Subcortical mapping uh, need to be done to, for descending motor pathway and also language track. So the functional MRI, uh, the GTI and neuro navigation, as we know, it cannot uh, replace the awake cranial and the functional tissue may be found with an infiltrative tumor mass. So 2.5% permanent worsening despite negative mapping. The morbidity that was presented recently is 16.5% to 13% new one and 4.5% permanent. This is the protocol in our Indonesian National Brain Center. So if we found a tumor in eloquent area, mostly now we offer for the patient that has interactual tumor supratentorial, if the Karnofsky more than 70 and the neuro behavior and cognitive evaluation uh, before surgery, uh, it showed only normal or mild disturbance, then we will educate the patient to uh, underwent the awake craniotomy. If the patient uh, willing to underwent the awake craniotomy and have a very good cooperation, then we will go direct to awake craniotomy. So what we are using in our hospital is the awake, awake, awake protocol. So the patient was uh, awake uh, during the whole surgery because in other centers, they are asleep, awake, asleep, where the patient only awake when we need to assess the uh, neurological um, assessment. And we are doing OR tours. So one day before the surgery, we asked the patient to come to the OR to, 
to understand what they will um, face uh, the day after. So hopefully we can lower the anxiety level. So usually our anesthesiology will walk through all the process uh, one day before uh, surgery. Intraoperative, we are using the interoperative monitoring and also the neuro behavior and cognitive evaluation. And afterward, two months after, we did the post-operative neuro behavior and cognitive evaluation. So here's an example. Um, in our institution, we have our own um, intraoperative monitoring neurologies. We are using um, neuro navigation, but we also have the uh, neuro behavior team that will assess the patient. So this this can also show that um, with even with the um, the anesthesia, sometimes uh, finding it hard to find um, the dexmedomidine, the the one that's actually. Uh, being suggested, but the patient uh, doesn't feel any pain and can um, follow the instruction uh, nicely. So this, uh, in this case, I would like to uh, show um, the we did the GTI before the surgery, and it showed that all the tracks are being pushed. Uh, so it's actually possible. So we have this patient being referred to our hospital because in other institution it it say that it's um it's a uh, it's not actually inoperable but it will be devastating so because this patient is still um very young so they are it's they sometimes they reluct in operating this kind of patient because of afraid of the morbidity afterward so we we are trying to convince um to spread more uh, using the awake craniotomy because it's actually uh, can help the patient um, to have lower morbidity without having to be referred to other island. So here, um, this patient um, were assessed the speech and also the motor, and we are using only the yellow fluorescence. I know that this is not ideal, but currently um, the 5ALA is not actually um, available in our country because, um, of course, it's too expensive. And for the second case, a uh, 13 years old, uh, right-handed student, um, his, uh, he is actually can speak in Bahasa, English, and also Arabic. He has a right extremity weakness, incoherent speech, and difficulty in math. Um, so here is the MRI. So um, it showed um, that there's a huge uh, lesion. And from even from the MRI, we only, uh, I mean, we can already predict that this might must be uh, higher grade tumors, and we want to keep the patient um, um, as much functioning as possible. Even though we know that it's it's very hard to uh, fight the higher uh, grading grade of tumors, so we perform the TTI and also the spectroscopy. And then um, we, we also, I'm sorry, this is in our language in Bahasa. So we ask because of the complaint was also in um, math. So we asked the patient to um, perform a simple uh, mathematic um, calculation. And also because, I mean, this was done during the early period of um, pandemic so we are still using um, all this protection and we also asked the patient to speak in another language mm -hmm. in in Arabic for praying because we I know that it's pretty far but uh, in the very beginning because of the patient also has a, a complaint a difficulty of speech so we want to preserve uh, as much as possible but yeah, unfortunately, after the surgery, um, the patient underwent the chemo radiation. It was a GBM, and then um, the patient had second surgery. But after eight months, um, he passed away. And this is another case: uh, male, forty years old, with a recurrent GBM, post chemo radiation. So here's the. The three one is the MRI before. So I understand that in the recurrent uh, cases, it's it's very hard to uh, make a decision when to do surgery and also, of course, to perform uh, weight craniotomy because 
if it's already recur, then uh, we should be in balance. How much should we take? Because um, we also want to keep as much as possible the patient function. So um, this patient is still 40 years old. So we are trying um, as much as we can to, to take uh, the tumor uh, out without uh, causing a new um, morbidity. And this is another example. So this was not done in our repro hospital. This was done in another city. So we are trying um, to have this awake craniotomy being done for not only in one or, one or two centers in Indonesia. So this was done in West Java, a male 59 years old, came with a seizure and headache. Um, here we did uh, several evaluation uh, with the neurologist, with the epileptologist, and also with our neurobehavior uh, neurologist. So um, after, uh, I think because of the The facilitation is different. Um, it's not as well equipped as the referral hospital one. So we don't have narrow navigation. So we open um, bigger than usual and we are using more um, basic um, equipment there, but it's actually what, we, what I want to show here that is actually possible even though uh, we only have a uh, basic equipment, as long as we have the interoperative monitoring and we have a very good team, I think it's it's possible and it should be um, a, a choice uh, standard, um, the first choice for neurosurgeon to perform the awake craniotomy, especially if it's the eloquent area. And I would like to extend a little bit during the fellowship, uh, on not only awake craniotomy was being performed um, in daily basis there, but it's also going to the day surgery. So it's, of course, it will be, um, depends on the patient selection and patient preparation and education. So um, no airway manipulation or invasive monitoring um, for airway and only giving uh, the adequate local anesthesia. So no, uh, no need to do a block, block. So as long as the patient is comfortable and appropriate draping, um, minimal lesion targeted image guided flap, so a very minimal flap, uh, and preferably through linear skin incision. And then um, we performed the surgery as a team, as usual, and we did the brain mapping to see the motor function and then language evaluation, and then do the tumor resection and fast closure. It's because of this small flap, usually linear incision and then no range. And the patient will be observed in PACU, post anesthesia care unit, only for four hours. And then we did the CT scan four hours postoperatively and um, will be uh, observed in day surgery unit only for two hours and then discharge in the same day after the neurosurgical evaluation with uh, the written instruction. So, uh, in the paper 2008, um, it's already shown that uh, day surgery for awake craniotomy for removing brain tumor is feasible. Um, I'm also trying to um, apply this in our country, but because of the, maybe because of the education to the patient, they are more reluctant to go home the same day. Um, I have not yet uh, able to apply uh, this kind of day surgery here. But I think this is a very good um, um, uh, development of awake craniotomy so that the patient also thinks that it's safe and they can, um, they can monitor, um, uh, they can be very cooperative and monitor if they have any um, symptoms um, that they are concerned of, they can have a contact with the surgeon, but we don't have to ask them to stay longer uh, in the hospital. Two minutes, uh, Sylvie. Also, okay, thank you very much. And also, this is also very nice where they use all the uh, laptop to show instead of what we have in our hospital, it's only with the paper based. Okay. Um, so, uh, weak craniotomy is uh, actually feasible, simple, and it can maximize the safety section. Of course, it's not the only uh, procedure that can help the patient. The molecular study and also the pathology is very important. 
Um, it's developed uh, in the beginning for the epilepsy surgery only in the eloquent area, but then it grows to that can be performed in all the supratentorial tumor and hopefully it can be done in the day surgery with craniotomy. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Sam. Thanks a lot, Sylvie, for this excellent presentation. And thanks for making us uh, believe that although light, um, little resources, you can do it. For this beautiful presentation and the message for everybody uh, attending and for anybody anywhere that the time of a biopsy for corpus callosum glioma is over. We have to find this attitude of just taking a biopsy because these tumors are thought to be inoperable. These tumors are operable and you can get good results of them. So thank you, Abida Shah, for this uh, message to everybody. Stop doing biopsy everywhere in the world for corpus callosum glioma because radiation is harmful. It will do nothing because radiation is volume related to the tumor left. So the the, the, the more you remove the tumor safely, the better the results. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Sabi. Is there any question? Hello, hello, Sam. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Uh, so my question is, um, when you don't operate on corpus callosum, if, will you operate on every case or what are your limits? No, my limits are probably the performance status of the patient, the age of the patient, and if it is a high-grade tumor involving especially the splenium, if it is anterior, the more anterior it is, I will err in favor of surgery. But if an 80-year-old walks in with a high-grade splenial tumor, and I know that I'm not going to be able to give a better quality of life, I might just say, okay, I will hold on. But otherwise, yes, nowadays the trend has changed and I'm operating. Also, the other tumor that you saw that was involving completely all the fibers of the corpus callosum, that is again another one that I might not enter into. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Abida. We can't have um, any more questions because of the lack of time, and we will discuss it um, in, um, in other session. Thank you, Abida. Thank you, sir. And now uh, to next speaker, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Zwiri, please start sharing your screen. To uh, Marfand. Yes, it's my personal pleasure to introduce Manfred Westphal, who is formerly chief of the Department of uh, Neurosurgery in Hamburg, and they had pioneered uh, uh, liquid biopsy as one of the tools in neuro-oncology. And please, Manfred, the floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself. So unmute and hope to share my screen and see how it works. and presentation so can you see my screen yeah yes okay very good so this is a very different topic um it's more biology um and the idea is that we really like to monitor uh, the disease um <clears throat> and uh, a lot of diseases are monitored in this from the circulation and especially in oncology, um, people shift to soluble markers. Um, and there are a lot of markers available. Um, and the highest informative marker would be circulating tumor cells, which are used uh, in many instances now in, in breast cancer and in lung cancer um, to monitor the disease and to predict metastases. And they're highly specific. So we looked uh, whether there's anything like that also in glioblastoma. Um, which in a way is a futile um, attempt already because uh, almost never do we see um, metastases from uh, glioblastoma. We see them in transplant patients, um, and this is an indication that there should be um, maybe circulating tumor cells in glioblastoma patients under that specific condition. So we um, then embarked um, <clears throat> onto a study um, where we looked over a lengthy time period, whether in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients and also in recurrent patients post uh, preoperatively, um, <clears throat> we can uh, draw blood and then see whether there are circulating tumor cells in there. So the methodology is quite um, elaborate, but Klaus Pantel is one of the pioneers of circulating tumor cell 
and liquid biomarkers. So um, we, we did that together with them in the Department of Tumor Biology. And with specific staining, you can actually occasionally find uh, these individual tumor cells indeed um, in the circulation. Um, and um, they can even be characterized. They can be picked and characterized more molecularly. Um, <clears throat> and um, doing that, we were able to see that um, <clears throat> we found in about 20% which was amazing to us at that point. Um, and we published that in, uh, in science in science advances. Um, we were surprised that 20% of the patients actually do have circulating tumor cells. But when I say cells, it would be one or two cells sometimes in, this, in a whole sample. So there are very, very few of them. Um, and they are really truly re reflective of the tumor because um, when you look at these cells sing on the single cell level and, and do genomic analysis, you can actually see that these passenger mutations, which are characteristic for individual tumor cells, um, they're not really onco oncogenic, but they're passenger mutations. They think you can find them in the tumor, but also in the individual tumor cells. So they're representative. Um, <clears throat> what we then opportunistically uh, compared is whether there was any biological clue um, about the patients um, that would be reflected in the clinical setting. But unfortunately, there was no um, correlation with survival in these patients. Um, and so the patients uh, with and without uh, circulating tumor cells had similar survival curves. There was some correlation with the presence of immune cells. Um, so whether in patients that had a decreased infiltration of CD3 and CD8 uh, cytotoxic T cells, um, <clears throat> those patients um, had um, <clears throat> a higher, um, the, the, when there were less, uh, more cells than uh, the, or the, the patient that had uh, circulating tumor cells had less of those infiltrating cells. So maybe there's some element of immune surveillance um, it was different for um, macrophages um, and microglia being uh, looked at by the CD68 markers. Um, they were similar between the patients that had circulating tumor cells and had no circulating tumor cells. So in general, we were asking our, ourselves then, will C CTCs be useful tools for the uh, for neuro-oncology of glioblastoma? Um, we were not able with a lot of um, effort to grow these cells, to get some more specific information and maybe to derive models um, for metastases for them. So um, the question then is, will they be used for biomarkers um, <clears throat> for the cause of disease um, or are there other biological biomarkers that are better? So for the CTCs, we more or less conclude um, that um, for the, the monitoring through a tumor evolution, they will not be very useful because um, there's a heterogeneity of coexisting glioma subtypes in or cell subtypes in, the, in each, each tumor. And although a single cell gives you the complete picture of a cell, it's only for one cell and maybe not representative for the whole tumor. Um, if that would be the single representative cell that we find, but it's very, very unlikely because it contradicts the concept of heterogeneity. So the purpose of a biomarker really is to detect disease, not so much in glioma, um, but to monitor disease, which in glioma is also very important, to predict prognosis, which is even more important, as you will see later, guide therapy, and correlate with disease sequelae. So another source um, of information is circulating um, DNA, which is or RNA, um, which is very often uh, confined um, in microvesicles, um, which is sort of very often seen as cell-free uh, genetic information. Um, so in a study that was done at Hopkins, unfortunately, it is always the same with, with glioblastoma. Um, you see here with the red underlined um, that uh, anything that is in the circulation compared to other tumor types is or usually the least to be found in glioblastoma. So the, the information that's getting out of a tumor is very scarce. Um, but if it gets out, um, that then, especially when it gets out, in a cell-free form, in a more soluble form or more compact form, it will represent um, <clears throat> the, the whole tumor, what's going on in a tumor, because it comes from all cells at the same time. Um, so that could be really very informative information. And we embarked on further studying then um, extracellular vesicles. So <clears throat> when you look at the concept of uh, liquid biopsy, you have cell-free DNA, 
cell-free RNA, circulating tumor cells, but you also have these extracellular vesicles, which conceptually are here a little larger than the tumor cell, but in reality, they are actually much smaller. Um, and But these extracellular vesicles, they are very interesting um, and, and, and very interesting entity because um, they are in different shapes and different forms. Um, they're called microvesicles or exosomes, and there is a whole society just con con concerned with the uh, nomenclature of, of these um, sort of um, particles that contain a lot of information because the, the information that is in these extracellular vesicles, I, I just ref, refer to them as EVs now in the, in the talk, is proteins, mRNA, uh, microRNA, DNA, um, and it also reflects the mutations. So these are really um, a very interesting um, entity to, to deal with because not only can you sort of analyze them, but we know from other entities and from other experiments and from other biological contexts that these EVs are long distance communication um, methods or the, the tools for um, for the body where over long distance, um, a lot of biological um, processes are influenced. Um, <clears throat> they will influence endogenesis, they will maybe prepare the metabolic, the metastatic niche um, somewhere else in the body. Um, they will influence the immune system. So there are all kinds of uh, biological actions that these uh, extracellular physicals, these EVs can manipulate. So when, <clears throat> when you analyze them and when, when we isolate them, our idea is then to, to correlate them clin to clinical features and to um, characterize them in their methylome, proteome, and also genetically. Now, a first very simple biological correlation is that patients that have a glioblastoma and you'd look at the blood preoperatively, they have a much higher uh, level of circulating EVs than healthy donors. Healthy donors also have EVs. We all have EVs all the time because they are a means of intercellular communication. But in a tumor or in a disease state, um, they go up and you see it's a logarithmic state. So it's actually quite impressive how, how, much, how many more there are. Um, and I already said that there are all kinds of EVs. Um, so when you look at the size, um, there's a little different uh, shape um, in the size distribution there um, in the glioblastoma. They are more confined to a smaller type. Um, but morphologically, they all look the same. Another very simple correlation is we took an arbitrary uh, cutoff and, and, and said, well, we will say as of this cutoff, these are patients that have a high level of EVs and those patients have a low level of EVs. And then we looked at progression-free survival and overall survival. And <clears throat> not unexpectedly, uh, patients that have a high um, level of EVs um, have a lower survival. That could be a reflection of the tumor vitality or viability, but it's also a reflection of the permeability of the tumor to uh, get EVs out. And if these EVs then indeed have the biological action um, um, that we assume they will have, they will influence the, 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 the body or the, the, the host uh, into a pro-tumorigenic or pro-tumor uh, environment. So they actually uh, favor the, the tumor state. So that's not un, uh, unexpected. And it's a very simple correlation, uh, but biologically, I think it's very meaningful. Um, we also then looked at um, what is what maybe the, the, the reason for that. Another very simple clinical correlation, looking at the size of the contrast and or the volume of the contrast enhancing tumor and the volume of the flare. And what really correlated um, with the number of EVs is the flare. So um, it's much more um, uh, important uh, to consider the, the flare volume than the contrast enhancing volume, which actually may be also prognostically um, that patients who have a higher flare have a better reverse prognosis because they will have more EVs um, and that is the, the determining the prognosis. So um, here that's maybe more interesting, also very interesting in the context of what we heard from Jörg Ton about the resection earlier th today, um, is that indeed the EVs are very good biomarkers um, for uh, radicality of resection or extent of resection because they go down and they go down very fast within a day. Um, and then in, in the following week, they go down even further. Um, and um, 
it's, it's actually a, a good correlation between subtotal resection and gross total resection. So I, I just use these terms now, um, but Jörg will say, well, they have to be more subspecified according to Rana criteria, but that could be some work for the future um, and uh, to correlate this with the Rana criteria. Um, we can image that and mirror that, and this is not just a arbitrary clinical phenomenon. This is under very defined clinical condition, uh, the experimental conditions, where we have uh, xenografts growing in a mouse brain, and you see in the bottom them at the seven Tesla mouse uh, MRIs, and the tumor grows in the mouse brain, and you can see that as the tumor grows in the mouse brain, the EVs that we can get from the mouse blood, um, they, they go up steadily. So. Um, that is, um, and also that correlates with the uh, developing edema. So that is actually um, a, a very well-defined uh, model that confirms what we see in the human. Now, what we really want, we want, really would like to have biomarkers um, that we can reliably um, get from the circulation. And those would be, of course, um, specific, specific EVs which we do not have yet, um, and it's, it's, it's work in progress, and not our, no one in our lab, but in many other institutions. Um, there are certain markers, the tetraspanins, which are on the surface um, of these EVs, um, which sort of dis distinguish a, a little better um, between the EVs that are in the in, in this normal circulation and, and the tumor circulation. Um, and they may even distinguish between um, different types of tumors. Um, so we, we look for the, these markers that actually really work in progress to see what are the best uh, isolation procedures to get tumor-specific EVs. Um, you see that the tumors go up um, when the tumor recurs. So it, it would be a, a very good tool to really monitor the, the, the development of the disease. Now, um, the EVs um, are also a very good tool, um, as I said, to, to study the tumor biology of the individual tumors, and not only um, as a biomarker, but they may also give us some hints of, of to use EVs therapeutically later. But right for now, we, we went into the depth of EV classification and see whether which EVs are really from reactive or from the microenvironment or from the tumor. Um, and because we always have to keep in mind that the EVs that enter the circulation are from very different tumor zones, from the infiltrating zone, from the vital zone, and also from the uh, <clears throat> necrosis. And when we then sort of looked at well, how stable is the, um, are the is the EV characteristic, and we look at, at the tumor um, itself, and then we look at the um, at the tumor cells that we isolated in the culture, and uh, then we look at the EVs that are secreted from those cells. Um, <clears throat> we were actually quite surprised that um, when we then looked at the methylation pattern, which is, I think, a very good genetic fingerprint um, of the, 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 what's in, the, in a tumor, that very often, uh, in, in almost all cases, the tumor and the EVs um, from the tumor, from the individual tumors that are different among each other, but from a specific tumor, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, tumor EVs um, or the, the information in the tumor, the methylation pattern in the cells and the, and the methylation patterns of, of the EVs um, actually matches. And this was here, is here I think, a very elaborate um, demonstration of that. You have here is a copy number variation of, based on the methylation array, um, the Heidelberg classifier, and you see here one of the cell lines the tissue um, and the EVs, and they have virtually the same pattern. So I think the, from the EVs, you can potentially really get a fingerprint from the tumor if we will be able in, at, at some point to really specifically and in good quantity isolate them from the circulation, which is not as easy as here from an in vitro system. Um, <clears throat> which is also interesting is that the EVs are entering the circulation. This is a GFP um, labeled tumor that is injected into a mouse brain um, and grows there. And when you then look in the lymph nodes in the, in the, uh, in the neck, you can find that there's EV material in the lymph nodes. So the, the theory that these tumors, in, uh, the, these EVs are methods of communication and influence the host is, is very, very viable and very, very likely. So um, <clears throat> the question really is, get me sufficient quantities, um, which are from the tumor and not from the microenvironment. Um, <clears throat> and for the tumor uh, environment is, um, 
can we uh, really get the handle on the systemic manipulation of the host? Um, and, and this is, as I, as I re repeated, this would be the, the, the Chatra Spanins, these the CD81, um, CD9, and CD63 markers, which um, very specifically are only double expressed on EVs, so they may be good tools. And why do we want that? We want to correlate um, the, the, from the circulation at, at different time points what's happening on in a tumor. And why do we want to do that? Um, one thing is that um, when we know that the um, RTK2 methylation pattern um, exists, that these, two, these patients will have a much higher likelihood um, to get, develop seizures um, during, the, during their disease. So you can put them um, on, on medication. And also it may be the indication, um, indication of a neural signature. Um, and with the glioneuronal interaction that is emerging now as relevant, you may actually get some new therapeutic approaches from that if you know that in, in, in early enough. Then also um, the, the, the methylation pattern, the, the uh, receptor targeting and kinase uh, characteristics um, are important for um, the extent of resection influence on overall survival. Um, we found that um, in looking at the RTK2 uh, compared to RTK1 and at the extent of resection, not in, in the RANA criteria yet, but um, like close to the RANA criteria, we found that um, residual tumor is much more influencing the survival in RTK2 than it does in RTK1. Um, and it actually distinguishes um, <clears throat> the, the, the survival uh, risk uh, or the, the, the survival um, effects of resection um, much more than anything else, the same as what, what Jörg found with the MGMT, um, MGMT the, which may not have an influence. Um, but the RTK2 is really important um, on the extent of resection. And if you know that prior to surgery, um, that would be able, maybe even enable us to take more risk with the patient and discuss with the patient that we take something into account, um, but go for complete resection. Um, so this is just another rendering saying that the it also holds up for the progression-free survival, not only for the overall survival. So um, the, there's an outlook um, on the possibility that EVs can be used to manipulate cells. This is just from an in vitro work that uh, was done in Boston from uh, Franz Riklevs um, that shows that if you uh, compare um, EVs that you put on, on lymphocytes um, <clears throat> and block these EVs with the NTPD1, that you get very different uh, biological effects. So they may be actually be used for therapeutics and there are clinical trials already going on with that because you can bioengineer these e EVs. So in summary, um, I think that there is a multitude of liquid biomarkers that are interrogated in neuro-oncology for diagnostics and for therapy monitoring. Um, it's still work in progress. CTCs may not be useful. Cell-free DNA, um, which we, um, in, in our context, um, say is something that is in EVs that contains representative biological information um, for the whole tumor, including, including also proteins, because you can also do proteomics, um, and the cDNA allows for the genetic information. Um, and um, they have fast dynamic, dynamics, so they are ideally um, suited to be biomarkers um, because you get a real-time disease monitoring, um, and as technology evolves, we may also use them uh, potentially later um, for um, therapy. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Manfred, for this excellent talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If this is not the case, I would like to ask one quest quick question. Um, yep. If you have the EVs and you could... But um, we have not done that yet, and I don't know um, how, but it's a very interesting idea um to to get something um that uh, would really re reflect the tumor's behavior under therapy um would of course be very in interesting for tumors that are non resectable um where you have a large amount of evs and where you prior to treatment would start that but um, that that would be a concept that is interesting to develop thank you very much yeah great so thanks again and now i'd like to hand over the chair to Professor Jing Li Wu. Thank you. Uh, it's my great honor to host this session. And uh, the second speaker is Albert Severnov. 
And uh, Dr. Sivyanov is from Russia. And uh, now he is the member of WFNS uh, Neuroendoscopy Committee and also exec Executive Committee of Asia Congress of Neurosurgeon. And uh, today, Dr. Sivyanov's lecture is glioma surgery in a, a hybrid intraoperative CT scanner operating theater. Uh, please, Dr. Sivyanov. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for give us possibility to share our experience and good day for everybody. Uh, our, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Speak. and share my slide. Share my slides, okay? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. The uh, in, uh, what is the uh, one of the main uh, main problem in glioma surgery? So. Uh, one of the main problems is uh, uh, we don't uh, achieve total tumor resection. So uh, we have a lot of current neuroimaging methods, uh, like uh, uh, interpretive ultrasound, uh, five ALA, ICT, neuronavigation, and, and, and so on. But uh, all, all along, these methods don't give our possibility for the, our main aim in this kind of surgery the total, to, uh, total tumor resection. So why uh, in our experience, we uh, try to combine these current methods, uh, like uh, for example, ICT for uh, plus uh, uh, eye ultrasound navigation and so on. And uh, uh, in, uh, for, this, uh, for this, our aims, uh, aim, main aim of total tumor resection, uh, we are pay attention to the, to the usefulness of ICT perfusion, ICT interoperative CT perfusion in uh, for glioma surgery. Uh, first, uh, first uh, pay attention for the high grade glioma. Why? Because uh, high grade gliomas uh, can be uh, highly invasive and extremely vascular tumors. Two of the most important factors in determining of the malignancy of the gliomas. First one, ability of the infiltrate the brain paren par parenchyma. And second one is recruit or synthesize uh, vascular networks for the further growth, no angiogenesis. So now uh, some, uh, some recent uh, papers about uh, the role of the perfusion uh, CT in glioma uh, surgery, uh, 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 also we uh, have in midline, for example. So uh, what give us the computer tomography perfusion? Uh, perfusion imaging using CT scan provide additional information about the tumor vas vascularity and angiogenesis for characterizing the gliomas. So uh, CTTP provides a linear relationship between tissue attenuation and tissue concentration of a contrast agent. Uh, unlike, for example, perfusion MRI imaging. And uh, uh, hence probably provide a more robust and less blazed estimation of the high, the high dynamic tumor blood volume and physiologic tumor vascular thickness parameters. And as you see on the slide, it's clear, clear, possible to see the uh, bed of the tumors uh, of high uh, hypervascularization. So, uh, uh, how the data and, uh, for example, you see interpretive CT perfusion uh, after removal of the tumor, you see the total removal. And in this example, you see the uh, uh, near the total removal, just remnants. And this remnants is very clear recognized in the uh, interpretive CT perfusion imaging. And also the, uh, some, some uh, literature data also uh, uh, give us possibility about this perspective of this uh, technology for the uh, um, control of the remnants in glioma surgery. For example, correlation of the various tumor perfusion estimates with histologic angiogenesis makers could this be very useful as far as in vivo in identification of these different regions of the angiogenesis in concern and could benefit clinician, clinicians in total tumor removal during the operation. So why uh, we pay uh, gross attention to the interoperative CT perfusion for the uh, tumor removal uh, estimate. 
city brain perfusion has some advantages and disadvantages. So, so we have a lot of adventures uh, uh, compared to other new, uh, new image interviews, new image, for example, fast, available, suitable for invasive care patients, affordable, safe for different implants, uh, high spatial resolution, and uh, and and so on, uh, and so on. But these adventures is not so many, so insignificant, insignificant compare the results. Also, also usefulness uh, interpretive CT in low grade glioma surgery also estimated uh, in our experience and in the experience of the literature uh, of main prominence uh, neurosurgeon. So, uh, so if, if you see from this article uh, from Hasoda, a surgical resection of using ICT may also improve the outcomes in the patients with uh, live grade glioma. So this technology about the uh, uh, perfusion ICT is very uh, valuable in the glioma, so interpretive glioma surgery imaging. <laughs> also, uh, very interesting technology is interpretive ultrasound. And you see the uh, possibility of the, uh, of the ultrasound, uh, interpretive ultrasound in, uh, in glioma surgery, for example. You see uh, our uh, ultrasound device, and you see the uh, very nice, beautiful image. And it's possible to uh, make a fusion of ultrasound uh, with CT data, with CT MRI, with CT MRI with the functional uh, area, with CT uh, with MRI with the um, uh, uh, tracts, tractography, and so on. So, so now the uh, interpretive ultrasound in glioma surgery is. Uh, a rapidly developed area in uh, uh, modern neurosurgery. You see the another example. You see the vessels, doppelometry inside of the tumor, for example, and it, it, and the ultrasound is navigated also. So it's a, a very good combination with the navigation, ultrasound and navigation, real time surgery. And also another good option is the uh, uh, interpretive CT. So we have first in Russia interactive hybrid operation room with full control and more guaranteed result. And uh, one of the most important of the, our uh, 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 hybrid operation room is the possibility of the automatic uh, registration, automatic registration. And uh, you see the organization of the, our penitentiary group with the ICT uh, just for this glioma surgery. So you see the, the, uh, the uh, interpretive CT from Toshiba. You see the, for example, uh, exoscope and microscope is possible. And you see the neuro uh, navigation, brain lab, uh, ultrasound device, and you see the navigated ultrasound uh, transducer. It's also very important. And also uh, some aspirators with the possibility of intraoperative neuro monitoring. You see, also navigated, and the possibility of the neuro monitoring also possible. So this is our standard equipment for this kind of surgery. And you see, now we have some uh, algorithm about the, the surgery uh, using ICT in glioma surgery. If you have some glioma. Uh, low-grade glioma surgery, because if for low-grade glioma surgery, so perfusion not so not so important, so only native uh, CT and interpretive ultrasound we use uh, with combination for complete tumor removal. If you, if you, if you have high-grade gliomas, uh, most important is the ICT perfusion with uh, interpretive ultrasound. And also, the uh, main aim is the complete total tumor removal. This is our examples. For example, the first one is the example for the high-grade glioma surgery. So this is a patient who is 46 years old, male. Uh, uh, only main complaint is only generalized seizure two months before without no neurological deficit. You see the MRI perfusion before, the big vascularization, pathologic vascularization before. This is MRI T1 with contrast. This is a tumor. 
And this is our surgery. First one, we start from the intraoperative ultrasound and we estimate, and this, this you see the transducer in the hand. And this is a picture, very, very, very good quality of the picture and estimate the size, the characterization, the vascularization of the, of the tumor. We start uh, after that, we start open. The ultrasound is before the uh, opening the dura. Then we open the dura very, very carefully just to save the old drainage vein and start to make a corticotomy. Uh, we uh, save the vein again. Start to devastation of the tumor, and this is a lot of lot of uh, small small pathologic vessels inside of the of the bed of the tumors, and the, very difficult to control because even coagulation uh, not so good uh, stops bleeding. So very precise, very precise. Coagulation cutting, coagulation cutting, and then you 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 see the we save the drainage vein. And now we start to use the uh, suction with the uh, possibility. You see the suction device with the possibility of the inter uh, interoperative neurophysiology monitoring. And we, every continue all, all operation, we estimate the interoperative monitoring data. Every time check by by suction the neurophysiological data, and also we uh, connect ultrasonic aspiration also with intramonitoring uh, possibility. You see the ultrasound also have possibility to monitor neurophysiological data very precisely to remove the tumor. And you see how a lot of bleeding because there's a pathological. Uh, blood uh, um, supply of the supply of the blood uh, is one of the main features of the, this kind of the uh, tumor, high uh, high grade glioma. After after interoperatively we 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 create the uh, interoperative CT perfusion technology and just uh, for estimate for the remnant. And in this case, you see the total on the native CT. And also, if you analyze, analyze, analyze the CT perfusion, also no remnants. So all pathological vessels we remove. So it's a guarantee of the total, uh, total removing, uh, 100 total removing uh, volume of the uh, uh, high-grade glioma. This is histology. Another example, for the low-grade low glioma, uh, uh, surgery, our our technology. Also, the also the uh, female is a uh, fifty three years old. Also, the main complaint is the generalized seizure five months before, so no significant neurological deficit. But this is the low grade glioma, and you see the MRI before. MRI before. Because not so necessary, not so significant uh, in this technology, in this technology, the perfusion te technique. So why the most important in this uh, kind of surgery is the, you see the no compare, no, 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 uh, no difference, no difference. So why most important uh, is the, um, in this kind of surgery, we use the interoperative uh, planning before just to navigate it, the, some tracts corticospinal tracts, for example, tumors and uh, uh, landmarks, venous landmarks, drainage, and so on, and ultrasound. So this is most important in this kind of surgery. You see uh, uh, planning before, this is a tumor. Patient position for the surgery. And now we start to open the dura, superior sagittal sinus is here. So very carefully, very carefully, not disturb the venous drainage because sometimes it's maybe disaster. You see the 
Venus drainage. This one, this one. And again, we see to the our uh, brain data. We see the tumors, sagittal, superficial sinus, presental gyrus. This is the tumor inside of the interpretive view. And you see the, uh, the suction with the possibility of the uh, neurophysiological data. And again, you see the Danish venous like a landmass because we know very well so, um, Danish venous is a good landmark for the, this kind of surgery, for glioma surgery. Open fissura. And now we start see the contact of the of the of the suction device just for interphysiology monitoring data. Now we start to detect the some functional area. You see now the press central gyros, drainage vein. and uh, start to localize by electrode the, the, the functional areas, important functional areas. Speech, hand, leg, and so on. Even interhemispheric fusion, we try to understand the functional anatomy. Yes. And uh, mark the zone. Second one is uh, we use pay attention, a lot of pay attention to the in, in, intrasound uh intervct ultrasound navigation and you see very well here the uh, possibility of ultrasound not only native ultrasound but we it possible for us just fusion uh, ultrasound with the mri mri tractography mri functional zone and so on this is very very important very important tools uh, for us for uh, in this kind of surgery because intervct perfusion is not so recognizable so why is most important attention is the possibility of the uh, real-time interpretive ultrasound with the fusion and navigation. Now we open the arachnoids and the, the uh, dissection plane we create. Also continuous monitoring, neurophysiology monitoring by suction device, continuous. Yes. And this is a, is a difference of the surgery of the high grade and low grade. So in low grade, the uh, vascular vessels not so pathological, so easy, easy coagulated. So not so many bloodings, so very precise surgery. But you must dissect, you must know very well anatomy of the gyrus. Anatomy of the gyrus, you must understand what kind of gyrus have uh, glioma and just dissect precisely dissect the gyrus with the glioma. It's very anatomical surgery. It's very anatomical surgery. And very clear surgery. If you know anatomy and good dissection of the gyrus. Again, every time aspirator check the neurophysiology data. Aspirator connect to connect to neurophysiologist. This uh, very anatomical dissection. <coughs> Without retractor, because you don't damage the, the by, by spatula, 
the surrounding, surrounding tissue. And uh, this is a uh, real frequent surgery uh, because I use a special device from David Pitschiovre from Burdenko. It's really frequent. No need uh, mouse switch. Every time in the focus and the very fast and very clean surgery. <coughs> and you see how it's pre I preserve the drainage vein. It's very important. You see drainage vein. Just only dissect. This place is very dangerous because you know, as before we check by ultrasound, the uh, corticospinal tract and placenta gyrus is very close. Ultrasound also connect to the neurophysiology monitoring device. Continuous during monitoring. Continuous during monitoring con uh, control. Every time control. Now remove total. Order. Check the place, good, good hemostasis, good dissection, you see, from the gyrus, other gyrus, good dissection mm -hmm. from the precentral gyrus, not disturb it here, protect by cotton, and save the drainage vein. This is the last state, state of step of the hemostasis. This is the interval CT control, native, native CT, total removing. In this case, by one piece, but not necessarily uh, no, all the time. Just only, uh, I'm not talking about the same This is uh, just, uh, just uh, histology. And another uh, very important uh, for, for my opinion, uh, the step is uh, education for glioma surgery to improve outcome. This is very important step. This is not simple surgery by only suction. All, all, all brain pathologists actually. First one, the uh, surgeon who want to start must know very well neuroanatomy, like for example, gyrus, dissection gyrus anatomy. And another one is you, you must understand and must uh, have a lot of wide meter dissection uh, training. Another one you have must have a good microsurgical technique and skills. And also uh, simulation training is also necessary. And for this purpose in our center, we organize uh, a cadaver lab uh, just for uh, educate, uh, uh, just to study uh, some neuroanatomy and the uh, uh, white matter and a lot of white matter dissection uh, technology. This is a, uh, uh, this is a uh, specimen from our residence. You see how it's beautiful, how it's beautiful. So a lot of people come around the world to our place just only for uh, and know the anatomy and dissect the and dissect the white matter. And we have uh, very good equipment for this kind of training. Also microsurgical technique in 3D, all, all, all cadaver lab is in 3D, just for training your skills, microsurgical skills. And also very important is, uh, sorry. Simulation training. You see example of uh, our, our residents uh, from Nigeria just have training for the glioma surgery. And you see by use the uh, uh, tools, 
and some data of the of the neural navigation. Uh, so uh, all these uh, kind of uh, steps, good technology, good equipment, ICT, perfusion, ultrasound, and even education step is very important for this kind of surgery. So we welcome uh, uh, for young residents who want to study this kind of surgery for our place. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sivyanov, for your very excellent skills for uh, glomerular resection. As we are a little bit behind our schedule, we have to skip uh, the Q&A. So the, thank you again. And the third speaker is Wasim Aziz. Dr. Wasim Aziz. I'm part of this forum. I um, also want to thank Professor Meng and Professor Christian Ton for this kind of invitation. So my screen is shared now? Yes, it's clear. Thank you. So, so I have no disclosures. This is the city of Abu Dhabi. It's a beautiful city in the Arab uh, United Arab Emirates. It's the capital. And it has a very beautiful desert too. This is the world famous attraction for Formula One and Freire World. This is my hospital. It is a 700 bed, uh, very new, brand new hospital. The largest in yeah, the UAE and one of the largest in the Middle East. So uh, today my presentation outline is the rationale of maximum volumetric safe surgical resection of low-grade glioma, why mapping and brain surgery is important, how we counsel our patients and how we do it. We have 118 nationalities in UAE. So counseling patients is very important because we have lots of patients coming from abroad with lots of cultures and lots of uh, different opinions. So, uh, rationale for surgical resection, usually these patients are very young patients and uh, low grade gliomas are continuously growing tumor that will slowly invade cortical and subcortical structures and will ultimately lead to functional neurological deficits. Possibility of malignant transformation of low grade gliomas is high, around 50% within five years. 90% of low grade gliomas will present procedures, which will affect quality of life for our patients. By resection, we can obtain more tissue to obtain more molecular classification. So lots of studies have confirmed that extent of resection significantly influences progression, pre-survival and overall survival, uh, such as this one by Reales from 2016. Another paper by Jacola, who is also uh, published uh, the difference between two groups in Nor Norway, between two big universities, one with wishful waiting and one with active surgical treatment and show the median survival was lower in the watchful waiting group. Also, um, seizure control is better if we do maximal resection. Uh, also, we have complete and near complete resection increases the malignant progression-free survival rates in such patients. So it is very important, important to do safe maximal uh, volumetric resection for these tumors, and also early resection will benefit these patients. Uh, for high-grade gliomas, it is also proven that it improves overall survival rate. Why mapping and awake brain surgery? Uh, staying inside the tumor is not always safe. If we, if you think that you, by being inside the tumor, you, you are safe, it's not. It is important to avoid post-surgical neurological deficits in these patients, because any post-surgical neurological deficit, uh, the survival benefit of your surgery will be lost, and the survival rate will be dropped. Also, the our preoperative imaging modalities and other intraoperative technologies cannot replace having an awake brain surgery. We have uh, preoperative functional MRI, but still, uh, especially for speech areas, there is bilateral dominance, and it is not good for language localization 
and we have second and third language sites which can be really identified by function MRI. By, if we only depend on DTI, it's also not an optimal uh, modality because we a brain shift during surgery will make it difficult to accurately localize bundle tracks, and sometimes bundle tracks are, will not be uh, very accurate in the preoperative DTI. Uh, for WIDA testing, we are not using WIDA testing now more anymore, but it is proved that by WIDA testing, there is bilateral dominance, which will not be able to decide by only WIDA testing. So that's why we depend mainly in brain uh, awake surgery and mapping during surgery uh, by accurately identification of sensory motor and language areas. We use continuous uh, sensory evoked potentials, motor evoked potentials to, to provide us useful monitoring tools. Subcortical stimulation will give us a five millimeter buffer against sensitive tracts. Mapping will maximize our resection. Sometimes mapping will decrease our resection by uh, identifying areas which is uh, not suitable to do more. So this is our indication for mapping and a weak craniotomy. This is our contraindication in, in non-cooperative patients due to disease, age, psychological status, psychosocial status, risks for airway compromise due to morbid obesity or medically intractable procedures or sleep apnea, comorbidities other than that because of high uh, risk of brain herniation during surgery. We do it by lidocaine, a uh, regional plot, uh, and in, we injected prior to the driving. There's a supraorbital, preauricular, postauricular, and then complete the field clock with typically between 80 and 100 cc. We either do a, a sleep a week, a sleep cycle uh, with general acidia and then uh, hyperventilation before neurotomy and extubate the patient and awaken before for the mapping and then reintubate after completing the reception or which is we more do in SSMC, which is conscious sedation protocol. Our anesthesia is very uh, comfortable to do this protocol. They have sedation initiated by total intravenous anesthesia, propofol or presedex and infusion stop just 10 to 15 minutes before mapping and ramifentanil to do for analgesia, patient awake for mapping and during critical part of the resection. Afterwards, probe before it started. We have to be careful about position, positioning of the patient. The head should be 20 to 40 degrees uh, above lateral, airway optimized by slight neck extension. Uh, we use an overhead table to avoid instruments coming in contact with the patient. We use clear drabbing. We use L bar for visual corridor to the patient is better. During surgery, we repeat the deep temporalis block. We sometimes do dural block. We open the du we don't open the dural until the patient is fully awake. We patient can, we, sometimes we notice that the patient can experience some pain in the ear uh, during dural opening, so we, we take care. Uh, we avoid narcotics due to respiratory depressants. We avoid this muscle relaxant inhalational agents. The renal airway should be uh, if needed, should be used. Uh, Antiepileptics, we, we, we cover the patient with antiepileptics. So during surgery, it's, this is a teamwork. We have to make everyone happy during surgery. We should make the uh, atmosphere calm and enjoyable to everyone. So for uh, motor mapping, we use uh, preoperative, and during surgery, preoperative MRI topography, functional MRI, DTI, but also we have to be care to know very well the anatomy, uh, which uh, for the motor cortex and uh, using navigation intraoperative, we use mapping for central circus localization, direct MAB localization of the motor cortex or direct cortical stimulation. So this is how we do it for the central sulcus localization. By uh, we use the median nerve, which is the most robust. We use uh, five four centimeter above the silver fissure. 
We put uh, four to eight contact electrodes strip placed in the transverse plane. And uh, this is how we do it. For uh, direct MEV localization of primary motor cortex, we use a strip electrode. We use the pulse width 200 microsecond, number of pulses four to six. This is the setting, our setting in, in for the neurophysiologist. We use the needle electrode, the hand face muscles or other muscles according to the location of the tumor. We do continuous MEVs uh, during frontal resection near motor cortex and the semi-motor tract. The risk of seizure from this procedure is very low. Uh, we use, for language mapping, we use the slides. We adapted a new slide, slide system for our patients according to the culture of the patient because sometimes the patient doesn't he has to know 80% of the slides at baseline before surgery. We use a black and white slides, no for no learning curve. And uh, we don't use culturally biased slides. And we always use EcoG to avoid seizures and determine the after charge threshold. And we go one to one to two milliampers below the after charge threshold. We are ready with the amidazolam and call irrigation for a seizure apportion if it's it happened. We usually do the cortical stimulation for language mapping by map face motor area first, because sometimes if we are near the motor cortex, we can have speech arrest. So we can mistake in the motor area for speech area. We do stimulation at each site. It starts before the object appears. We stop the stimulation as soon as the object is correctly named. If not named correctly, we stimulate for the entire three to four milliseconds. Uh, we listen carefully to hesitations. Sometimes the patient will name it, but we'll name it in a different way. We will be hesitant or we'll have alteration in the voice volume. And this indicate uh, we are near the, the language area. So we have lots of multilingual patients in UAE, and we have also lots of people coming from with different languages. So in cases of multilingual patients, we often try to separate the anterior uh, areas from the posterior, the mother tongue from the second language. We also will be careful not to include multiple speech areas in the frontal and temporal lobes. Intraoperative cognitive monitoring, we use a neuro neuropsychologist and we continuously perform its rules of procedure by asking the patient to count, name, read something, or see his memory or calculation with the neuropsychologist. We continuously uh, interact with the patient to be sure that he's doing fine. So our tips is that if the dura is either into the brain, we can use transdural mapping. We repeat the task during the section of at risk cortex. Spontaneous speech doesn't, doesn't map to the same, same as object naming. We use object naming. We uh, protect the white matter connecting tracks. Uh, we, uh, a general anesthesia should be available anytime. Uh, we remember the areas. Remember that several areas are in charge of speech processing. We have lots of multilingual patients, as we said, be aware of the after discharges and potential subclinical seizures. So we should also always stick to my good microsurgical techniques, use of microscope, use of high magnification, should take care of preserving arteries. We don't underestimate veins as really eloquently uh, described by my previous professor, uh, retracting the tumor, not the brain. This is a 29 years old male patient presented by generalized seizures, which are was under control by two anti seizure medications. He is bilingual. Uh, MRI lesion in the right parietal loop showing increased T2 and slur signal, effacement of adjacent salsi, and loss of gray white, white matter differentiation. This is how we operated him. We use the spatial recognition also. So for awake brain surgery, it is a challenge mainly for anesthesia. 
careful selection of the patient, high level of motivation, motivation of all the team is very important uh, for glioma surgery and for treatment of glioma. I think we still need time to understand more, and we, with time, we will be better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Is uh, there any question or comments from the audience or lectures? Just a quick question. So for a weight brain mapping, uh, bipolar or monopolar? What's your preference? We use uh, bipolar, but for the deep, uh, we use monopolar. For what? Sorry. We use bipolar. bipolar. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Dr. Aziz. And Good ideas. Thank you so much, Atul. Thank you so much. I'm indeed very proud and very honored to be on this very elaborate platform. And I wish to give a different perspective to low-grade glioma surgery, a different concept. The concept is that gliomas are confined tumors. They arise and grow along a named white fiber track. And they can be removed like a meningioma. So this is a different concept. And I wish to elaborate on this concept. Glioma is a neurosurgeon's life. We have been working, we are trained in neurosurgery by operating on gliomas. We know how to operate on high-grade gliomas. But I must also tell you that high-grade glioma surgery is not easy. We used to, you know, in my times, whoever used to remove a high-grade glioma radically used to be a big neurosurgeon. But now I will say that how much to resect a high-grade glioma is questionable. Whether we should be very radical in glioblastoma or not is the question is still being understood. The question is about low-grade gliomas. Low-grade gliomas have been called as diffuse, infiltrative, and invasive. And for several years, other than biopsy or other than small resection or other than conservative non-surgical treatment or other than radiation, no other treatment was actually done for these tumors, considering that they are diffuse, they are invasive, and they are in critical areas of the brain. So many people were not operating on these tumors. But due to the work of several very pioneers in this field, one of them is Mitch Berger, other very big pioneer is Dufau, who, is, who will follow me in this lecture. These, these uh, big contributors have said that low-grade glioma surgery should be radical because radical surgery relieves symptom, it reduces tumor burden, it improves improves quality of life, increases longevity of life, and more importantly, it delays the malignant transformation. So now the whole world thinks that low-grade glioma should be removed radically. And for last 20 years, there are a number of modern technology. If neurosurgical technology has advanced, it has advanced in low-grade glioma surgery. So neuromonitoring, intraoperative um, MRI, CT scan, ultrasound, navigation, intraoperative dyes to resect if the tumor has been resected completely. But the most wonderful, most beautiful advance that has happened in glioma surgery in particular is understanding the white fiber anatomy. 20 years ago, nobody used to talk about white fiber anatomy and only frontal brain, parietal brain, temporal brain. These were the anatomy of the brain. So these white fibers form the foundation of the infrastructure of the brain. And they are so important and critical that we have now come to understand. Where does a glioma arise? Not many papers have been written. Glial cells, of course, gliomas arise from glial cells. But is there any pattern of origin and pattern of extension? Not many people have worked on it. Yasser Gil talked about it several years ago when he said that like middle cerebral artery, there is a wedge 
of supply of middle cerebral artery. Glioma's also have a wedge kind of supply uh, architecture. And there have been some recent articles on origin and growth of glioma's. So about seven, eight years ago, we described that glioma's are actually confined tumors. They arise from a white fiber tract. They expand and grow along a white fiber tract and the adjoining tracts are involved by virtue of pressure and deformation, but not by destruction. So the adjoining tracts are displaced and you can have a well-defined plane of dissection from the normal to the glioma. So this concept that they are confined, they can be removed like a meningioma has quite a bit of implications on surgery of glamas. If you have this concept that they are well defined, they are confined within a glioma, there is no normal brain. You can remove the whole tumor and mass. And this concept of end mass tumor resection is a safe, safe strategy, is associated with radical surgery and associated with as complete as physically possible. Nobody can say I can treat and cure glamas, but we can remove it radically. And if we have this concept, we can remove it radically. Needless to say that understanding white fibers has been part and parcel of my department. And we have done several articles on the white fiber anatomical studies about Pape circuit, about brainstem anatomy, and some of the most beautiful dissections have been done. You see, this is brainstem anatomical dissection and fiber tracts within the brainstem. So we have divided the fiber tracts into five groups in one of our papers. Superficial group is short association fibers or U fibers or arcuate fibers. Middle group are SLF, arcuate fibers, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, middle longitudinal fasciculus, uh, tracts and things like that. And central group is association fibers like corpus callosum, anterior commissure, posterior commissure, and vertical fibers are projection fibers. So these are the groups that we have decided. We divided glamas into two groups. One that arises from a short arcuate fibers, and these are localized glamas. These which go along the association fibers, we have called them diffuse glamas. So they grow from one side of corpus callosum in a butterfly along the corpus callosal, along the white fiber tract. And this is very important to understand. And the adjoining tracts are displaced. They are not infiltrated or not involved. So if we understand the radiology of glamas, a defined pattern of extension, we can actually identify a glioma from non-glial tumors like lymphomas and other tumors. If this is the tumor in the superior uh, frontal gyrus, it displaces the SLF down, it displaces the projection fibers by the feel, by the consistency, by the vascularity, and by the color, you can identify normal from abnormal and make a well-defined plane of dissection. This in the post-central gyrus, the projection fibers are displaced, not involved. And there's a plane of dissection. This tumor, which displaces the various fibers in this region, is defined. So when you see a tumor and we see a fiber tracks, you can identify that this is glamour and how the glamour is extending. Now I want to quickly show you some tumors. This is a tumor in the supplementary motor area. You all, most of you in the audience are experts on glamour surgery. You know how difficult this tumor surgery is. And this tumor is displacing the tract. I will like to quickly show you the video of this. Of, and I have to tell you that most of this surgery is completely unedited. You see, in this supplementary motor area, how I am with my suction. This is not as actually a suction. This is suction plus dissector. And I am dissecting the tumor from the normal brain by virtue of consistency. 
And this whole video, which I'm showing you, is almost completely unedited. So you can imagine this tumor in such a location, in such a dangerous location, you can do in quick, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, and with very minimum coagulation and very radical resection. So this is this concept of confined tumor, this con concept, you know, you can avoid away craniotomy, which is very difficult to avoid in some patients cannot tolerate away craniotomy. Difficult to avoid a lot of neuromonitoring, but we can avoid if we have, and we agree and believe in this concept that you can give well-defined pain by virtue of consistency. First, get the identify the tumor by virtue of ultrasound by navigation, and then design a quick plane of dissection, and you can do a radical, beautiful dissection. And this tumor has been removed from the supplementary motor area. Another tumor I'm showing, quite a large low-grade glioma, functional MRI, all those things are necessary or not necessary that you have to decide. And I will quickly show you an unedited version of this operation, little bit whatever editing is going on, I'm doing it here. You see, the tumor, how am I doing tumor from the normal brain? And little bit editing I have done with my cursor here and the whole tumor and nothing but the tumor. You see how, and this is not a, this is, I'm not sucking. This is my special suction, which su also sucks and also dissects. And there are eyes of mine in the tip of the suction. By, by the consistency, by the feel, I can make a plane of dissection. And whilst I'm making a plane of dissection, I have to be absolutely convinced that I am removing the tumor and nothing but the tumor and everything that I am removing is tumor. And I am not harming the normal brain, normal brain parenchyma. So this is a kind of a concept which can be useful. I am saying, I am not saying you don't use monitoring. I am not saying you don't use awake craniotomy. I am not saying all that. Please don't misunderstand me. But I am saying that you can design a well-defined plane of dissection and limit your dependence on a lot of these accessories that you are very familiar and you use it quite often. And you see in this critical area of the brain, I'm removing this tumor almost completely en masse. And in quick time, the whole operation in this huge tumor has not even lasted 10 minutes. And with very, very minimum coagulation, as you can see on the screen. And this is the tumor, and this has been resected very elegantly and eminently. This is another tumor. All of you will agree that this tumor is a dangerous tumor. This tumor in the region of motor strip, in the region of, you have to be absolutely careful. So first thing that you have to do is identify this is the normal brain or this is the normal. So this is on the basis of navigation and on the basis of various ultrasounds and all those things. This is the tumor. This is the region of the motor strip. And if just carefully see how I remove this tumor first from from a, away from the motor strip, and then I design a plane of dissection on the motor strip with very minimum coagulation, very minimum monitoring, just on the basis of understanding of the tumor consistency, vascularity, and the fact that they can be removed like a mini tumor. They can be removed like a complete resection like an extra axial tumor. Of course, this dissection I'm not saying is very, very elegant, but the concept which I'm trying to promote is that these tumors are confined tumors. You can limit your dependence on various things. Of course, controversy can be there, controversy should be there and will be there. But this is what I have to show you that how I'm designing and imagine I am working on the motor strip. I am working on the most, con most critical, most elegant area of the brain. And you should remember that if we create a hemiplegia in this patient, then it is not going to be accepted by the patient and by you. And you will criticize yourself your whole life 
that this technique is not a good technique and you will blame yourself. And you see how radical this tumor is. And this is the patient I had operated during Corona times. So en masse tumor resection is a strategy, is a concept, is a philosophy which can be used. And we have published this on several occasions. Connectomes are there, but even connectomes are displaced. When you examine the tumor and you examine the histopathology within the tumor, it is everything is tumor. There is no normal brain except in the periphery where during the dissection you can have some normal brain. So this is the tumor more relatively safer area and but no as we all know no area is safe no area is non eloquent but this surgical strategy of mass resection is possible and in my estimation if you are here to come to remove the tumor radically this is the most viable surgical strategy you see this this is the tumor here is the tumor and this is the how it is different color from the normal brain and there is a beautiful possibility of removing the tumor like design by designing a plane whether you remove it slowly whether you remove it piecemeal whether you remove it like this or whether you remove it by continuous monitoring will depend on your personal strategy particularly in cases which are not in the motor area or speech area, you can certainly use this strategy quite safely and quite effectively. So uh, this is the tumor. This is another tumor. So over the years, my as I do more and more of these, take, even in the parahippocampal gyrus, where I come and then start dissecting, you can have this kind of surgical. The other beautiful thing is high-grade glamas are high-grade by virtue of this multiplication factor, but they are still confined. They are invasive. They can, a well-defined plane of dissection can be had even in high-grade glamas, and you can have an n mass kind of tumor resection even in these tumors. And this is my... Now, insular tumors are also confined. The problem is the small vessels in the region are so critical that if you damage one vessel, you can create a very big deficit. So saving blood vessels is absolutely critical. Understanding the white fibers, understanding the tracts, understanding the arcuate fibers, IFOP, and various other things that we all know are so critical. I want to quickly show you a tumor in the Broca's area. You All of you will definitely agree that this is a danger point. You cannot operate unless you are convinced. You cannot make him a... And I want to show you how I removed this tumor and in an en masse fashion. And you just, uh, you know, because of the time limitation, I cannot show you, but this tumor also... Now just carefully see how I can there is a possibility of designing a plane of dissection. You see this tumor? How I can make this tumor dissect from the normal brain? And not a single, even there is some bleeding that is going on that you are seeing on the screen. There is not a single coagulation that you will see in the entire operation. And this is possible. And if it is possible, it might just be the best, best treatment option. And of course, this instrument which I'm using, suction in my right hand, is a very critical you know, this, uh, strategy of instrumentation is not a very common strategy, but if it can be understood, if it can be uh, used with elegance, I think you know there is a possibility of using it in a very fantastic and very beautiful fashion, and the whole tumor has been removed in the Broca's area. And this is the patient actually talking in Indian language. So there is no point in talking, showing you, but he is now talking immediate post-operative period. So, uh, and insular tumors, most important issue in insular tumor are two things. One is don't take a single vessel. If you take one vessel, you can demolish the person. Get to the fiber tract. Get which fiber tract is involved. Arcuate fibers or whichever. Uncinate tracts are very frequently involved in insular 
tumors, and then you can remove this tumor radically. First, maybe you like to little bit debulk this tumor, but you can then go around the tumor. Corpus callosum tumor, my associate has already discussed with you. Corpus callosum is such a wonderful structure. It forms the basis of the entire brain. It encases and involves the entire brain. So corpus callosal tumors can go from one side to another side, from forcep major, from you see how it is going along the fiber track and you can design a beautiful plane of dissection around it. There is no question in my mind this strategy. And this is the, if your concept is radical resection, if you believe in radical resection of low-grade glamour, this is a good way of treatment. Of course, you can use monitoring. Of course, you can use various other devices, but there is a possibility of radical resection in an en masse fashion. Be, paraventricular tumors, we had described this approach on the basis of fiber tract, orbital cortical approach for tumors in this area. And then we, my associate had written an article on this subject. If there is a tumor, whether you will come interhemispheric, whether you can come from wherever. But on the basis of understanding of fiber tracts, we use this orbital surface and attack this tumor and various directions of approach, where to go, how to go, various surgical strategies have been described on the subject. So these kind of high-grade tumors or low-grade tumors, you can see, use the orbital surface. So in short, understanding of the fiber tracts is critical, is absolutely mandatory if you have to do this kind of surgery, low-grade glamour effectively. You see, this is Pape circuit. And for the first time in the history of neurosurgery, the entire Pape circuit was dissected out of the brain by my surgical group. So I am very proud of what we are doing on anatomy. And we have recently written some articles on this subject. So thank you very much, my dear friend. It has been a great honor. And I hope I have been able to give some novel message to the esteemed audience. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for this very impressive talk. And uh, if there are no very urgent questions from the audience, I would uh, suggest in the sake of time to proceed to the next session, which will be chaired by Professor Shingo Fuji and Dr. Guru Sobi and from Japan. Thank you so much. Please introduce uh, the next speaker. Hello? Okay, can you see me? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, your introduction. So, my name is Shingo Fujo. I'm a neurosurgeon in Kagoshima University in Japan. So, uh, I also uh, introduce uh, Dr. Seichiro Hirono. Uh, he is assistant professor in Chiba University. Uh, his specialty is glioma and ayuk surgery. Uh, please introduce Dr. Hirono. Hi, everyone. Uh, tonight, we have great, great honor to introduce the Professor Dufour from Montpellier, France, who is the uh, expert in, the, in this field. So please start your lecture, Professor Dufour. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your invitation and for giving me uh, again uh, this opportunity to talk about interactions uh, between uh, natrastry of uh, gliomas uh, and uh, the connectome, uh, explaining why uh, uh, we achieved these results now with more than 20 years of follow-up, namely uh, an evolved survival prospectively uh, of more than uh, 17 years and the quality of life preserved in 99% uh, of cases, speaking about uh, more than 1,000 surgeries uh, performed in low grade glioma patients. And uh, we definitely achieved uh, these results by understanding that we have uh, to remove earlier and more extensively, but also by uh, understanding the brain uh, not only around but within the tumor, because uh, Everyone understood that, of course, the tumor are not uh, uh, confined, as you can see on this image, typically. And uh, if uh, you think uh, that you can remove a tumor mass uh, and block, 
then it's uh, just an illusion because you remove just a part of the tumor and you have no impact on the natural history of the disease and then you will not reach this kind of uh, very extensive uh, resection and overall survival around now 20 years. And of course, to preserve the quality of life uh, while removing a part of the brain uh, invaded by the tumor cells uh, around the, the pseudo tumor mass uh, in the middle, then you need to understand the connector. And it's not so complex if uh, you take time, uh, of course, to become a neuroscientist. Uh, and I will continue to claim that all neurosurgeons should be first of all neuroscientists before to um, pretend to operate the brain. And uh, to be a neuroscientist means uh, also that we have to understand mechanisms of neuroplasticity, but uh, its limitations. And uh, we have to be objective by uh, asking all patients, especially with a low-grade glioma, to do an extensive uh, neuropsychological examination, which will show you in more than 50% of cases that patients are not so well. Some uh, uh, degrees of cognitive deficits not related uh, to uh, the location, lobar location of the tumor, but related to the diffusion within uh, white matter tracts. We are which are definitely not displaced, but invaded by the tumor. And everyone understood that uh, everywhere in the world. This is the reason why we have to do mapping in order to remove a part of the brain invaded by chronic disease. And of course, this mapping should take into account the reorganization occurring before surgery. And you can use for that fMRI and DTI, but Everyone understood also that DTI is not the function. It's not my view. This is a fact. And uh, if you would like uh, to preserve 99% uh, uh, of uh, patients with quality of life, you need uh, to do an uh, awake mapping uh, with uh, electrical stimulation at the level of the cortex and the white matter tract invaded by the tumor, unfortunately, explaining why after 25 years, I'm not yet able to cure patients. I have to be humble. But I have understood that uh, we cannot say there is a dominant hemisphere or not dominant hemisphere. We need a brain. So I will propose systematically awake surgery in patients with uh, almost normal life, of course, before surgery. I do not speak about patients, comatose, or already hemiplegic or aphasic. I speak about preservation of quality of life. And quality of life means to avoid hemiplegia, to avoid aphasia, of course, but also to preserve cognition, emotion, social interactions, empathy, personality, and so on. Especially for patients, remember, who will live approximately one generation, 20 years. Indeed, if we are objective, not only before surgery, but also after surgery, and not just a standard clinical examination, you will see that many patients uh, continue to exhibit some degrees of cognitive deficits. So how to avoid that? We developed many years ago the concept of uh, multitasking into the operating theater. Namely, the patient is not just naming or just moving or just uh, understanding or just and so on and so on, but doing everything simultaneously. Like in real life, we are, as human beings, able to do many things uh, in combination in order to make a decision. And this is exactly what we're able to do in 2D operating theater, thanks to electrical mapping, but most of all, cognitive monitoring in real time. And then it's very easy to understand that, of course, we are removing the brain itself, the tumor mass, if you want, in the middle, but most of all, the peritumoral zone, in order to remove more disease and then allowing definitely patients to live 20 years more or less. And technology cannot help you today because DTI is not a function. So we have to be neuroscientists. We have to propose new models of cognition in order to continue to implement our own plasticity and to avoid to think as a surgeon, but much more to think as a neuroscientist, removing a part of the brain. And suddenly we understand that, of course, we have to preserve the connectivity because invaded by a tumor and that it's not enough just to preserve the pyramidal pathways in order to avoid hemiplegia. Indeed, if the patient is a, a, a surgeon, uh, likes uh, to be sport, uh, to, to do sport, uh, to play music, uh, what he wants, 
then you have to preserve uh, something much more important than movement cognition, namely very complex movement volition. You have not to decide for him, her. You have just to give the choice. And if the patient is telling you, I do not want to keep any permanent deficit, including complex bimanual coordination, you can avoid the supplementary molar area syndrome just after surgery by preserving not only the SMA, but also the frontostriatum tract, even if invaded by the tumor. You will tell me you will leave tumor. I will answer you, yes, but I will come back after mechanisms of neuroplasticity. Remember my median survival, more than 17 years. This is true also for the so-called non-dominant parietal loom without somatosensory feedback or awareness of your own body. You can run, for instance. It's critical for optic tracts because with an aminoptia in many countries in the world, you cannot drive, medical legally speaking. So you cannot tell me that patient 30 year old enjoys a normal life if he's not able to drive. You have to preserve the spatial cognition. You have to preserve the attentional processing as we published recently in Nature Communication or not. If the patient is telling, no, I retired, I can accept to have some degrees of cognitive deficit, remove more tumor, I will do it. So I will give the choice to the patient according to his expectations. I will do a la carte, but to do that, you need to understand the brain and the brain plasticity mechanisms and limitation. And to do that, you have to understand interactions between networks. Explain me why multitasking, because uh, you uh, ask uh, to the patient to do many things simultaneously, so to recruit many networks simultaneously, and you increase the sensitivity. Of course, what we have learned is that there is no one area corresponding to one function. Fortunately, explain me why uh, you can remove the so-called broker's area, because it does not exist. This is just a part of the network. But we have to preserve the connectivity, and you will tell me we know very well the anatomy, for instance, the arcuate fasciculus. I will answer you, no. Your surgeons, your anatomists, your scientists do not know the anatomy, especially because we do not know the cortical termination, for instance, of the arcuate fasciculus, because the vast majority of the subpart of this pathway are not connecting directly, anatomically, structurally, Broca's area to Wernicke's area. So we have to reinvent the real anatomy by taking into account the cortical termination, namely the network and not just the fibers. This is true also for the different support of the inferior frontoccipital fasciculus and not just to think that there is a stem and that's it. This is critical also for the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, which is very frequently invaded by tumor, explaining why. The vast majority of neurosurgeons in the world are doing an anterior temporal lobectomy. At that time, you cut the inferior longitudinal fasciculus because not pushed, but invaded by the tumor. And you will tell me the patient is well. No, because you can see an increase of reaction time even if the patient is not anomic. You will tell me we do not care. Yes, but it's directly correlated to the chance for the patient to return to work. You will tell me the most important is for him to leave. No, you have to ask him before to go to the operating theater. Do you want to work after surgery? Yes, no. And we have more than 95% of our patients able to return to work because we preserve also the connectivity in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere, which is of course absolutely critical, especially for multimodal semantics, but also for personality, mood, empathy. Indeed, if you are totally honest and if you ask to your patients if they change a little bit the mood, the answer is yes in 30% of cases. Is it possible to avoid that? Yes, by introducing new tasks into the operating theater and the patient can continue to move, to speak, but also uh, to um, map and monitor empathy. And then, of course, you can cut the pathway if you want, but the patient will have some modification of the behavior like depression, irritability, and so on. You have not to decide for him or her if they can tolerate that. You have to explain before surgery and to adapt the strategy into the operating theater according to 
its expectation and your knowledge of the connectome and the limitation of neuroplasticity, especially the right inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, which is also involved in the self-evaluation. Otherwise, you have a risk to induce modification of the metacognition, and then you are not really a normal human being, even if you can continue to speak and to move. So you imagine the number of fibers you cross when you operate a glioma within the right stratum sagittale, for instance. And I'm sure that 99% of people looking at uh, this uh, diaporama have the habit to operate in this location, especially in the right non-dominant hemisphere under general anesthesia by telling there is no risk. Of course, there is no risk for us as neurosurgeons, but the risk is very important for patients because so many pathways. Okay, the most important reasons, not my opinion, facts after 25 years of follow-up. So more than 1,200 awake surgery within so-called eloquent areas, broca's area, vernicus area, blah, blah, do not exist because networks, the mortality is zero. Despite very big tumor, we will publish in Journal of Neurosurgery next month, a paper only with tumor more than 100 cc. And the risk is less than 1%, even in this subgroup. But also, with 86% of cognitive preservation, plus 10% of cognitive improvement, plus 94 to 95 now a percent of patients able to return to work, plus 80% of positive impact on epilepsy, so improvement of quality of life. And definitely not against a median survival because this is probably one of the best ever reported. So I will continue to push the realization, of course, when I was not able to remove completely the brain invaded by the tumor during the first surgery because the patient told me I want absolutely to preserve this quality of life. Perfect. I will come back by using mechanisms of your plasticity acting between two surgeries, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, now, 20 years later. And this is exactly what we have now submitted in brain in revision, showing some map of modification of the cortical mapping between the first and the second surgery and so on. And you can use these mechanisms in order to remove more brain invaded by the tumor five years, 10 years, 15 years later, not against the quality of life and pushing more the survival. So that means that you can achieve this kind of very extensive realization while the patient continues to enjoy perfect normal life, not once again uh, avoiding hemiplegia, aphasia, but driving, working, taking care of the family, and so on. And to help younger people operate on the brain, not only for low-grade glioma, but also for high-grade cavernoma, epilepsy surgery, and so on, we published atlases based on the real function of the y matter tract and the cortex and the networks and their interactions, and not just our view in theory based on DTI, but the real truth into the operating theater based on serial investigation before and after surgery also and connected to the neuropsychological scores. So we have to understand that this instability of the connectome is very helpful, helpful in order to predict before to go to the OR at the individual level how much we will remove. Once again, not the tumor mass in the middle, but really the disease itself, or even to do supratotorization. It's critical to understand into the operating theater, not only if the patient will be aphasic hemiplegic after that, but if the patient will be able to return to work according to the reaction time. It's possible to elaborate strategies of postoperative cognitive rehabilitation in order to improve the cognitive scores three months after surgery in comparison with before surgery. It's possible to predict when to reoperate the patient because we cannot cure gliomas because they are diffuse, in a sense, unfortunately. But you can predict for one patient, I will reoperate you in a few years because the natural history of the disease and the brain reconnectivity, reshaping. So the take home message is very easy. If you understand the brain, you can operate the brain and then you will remove lobe 
or lobes independently of the glioma because you will find tumoral cells everywhere. This is the goal of the most extensive resection you can achieve, the principle of supratotal resection according to the connectome at the individual level. So I will continue to claim as conclusion that we have to be neuroscientists to understand the brain because we are connected to the connectome every week into the operating theater and we can decide to be blind or to open our mind. And if you do it, your patient will live longer and better. It's not a dream, it's done. If I can do it, you can do it without any technology, just by using your brain. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dufo, for your beautiful presentation, especially you emphasize the how important not only the specific tract, but also the uh, individualized personal tech, uh, uh, tactics for the preoperative uh, management and evaluations. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please start your lecture. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ming and uh, Sama for the kind invitation. And also my thanks go for the Oncology Committee of the World Federation. Uh, before I start, and I hope that the chairperson would not count this time because I want to present my country to the people of China. I don't think this is only a medical uh, exchange, but also a social exchange. So just a few minutes to uh, present my country and then I'll present my uh, case. So this is Jordan surrounded by Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and Israel, who are near the Mediterranean area. Uh, the Dead Sea we have in Jordan, which is the lowest point on earth, where you can flow on the surface of the water and have the usual classical mud treatment. The baptism site where uh, Jesus Christ was baptized in Jordan. This is the only recognized center in the world uh, for the baptism site. Uh, this is Pope visiting the baptism site. And uh, also the Mount Nebo. Petra, the jewel of the crown. Jarash, which is the second city after Rome with this Roman antiques and theaters. The major festival every year in Jarash, musical festival. The countryside of Jordan, people think of Jordan as a, as a desert, it's not. And uh, we have a snow every year. This is my house, uh, last uh, winter storm of snow. And this is the Black Iris Temple of Jordan. The first uh, hospital in Jordan was established back in 1927, and the first neurosurgeon was in back in 1962, Anton Tarazi. He trained in Montreal in Canada. The first CT scan in Jordan was 1978, we're country number 10 in the world to acquire CT scan. Uh, we've done the first cardiac transplant in Jordan and the Middle East back in 85. The first uh, IVF baby was back in 86. And the first gamma knife is in 1996. And this is me treating the very first case. We established our cadaveric lab in Jordan and we uh, helped to empower Arab women in neurosurgery. Actually, this is my daughter. She is the first in neurosurgeon in Jordan. I visited China many times. I'm glad to say it's my pleasure. So back to my presentation, and I hope I my timing starts now. Butterfly gliomas, by the WHO definition, it's a glioma that has an imaging evidence 
of invading the rostrum, the geno, the body of the corpus callosum with the frontal lobe involvement or to involve the rostrum of the corpus callosum. It is the most aggressive form of a GVM. So it can affect the geno, as in these cases, can affect the body, can affect the splenium, can affect the geno and the body. So we have to look at, uh, carefully at the corpus callosum and it's part of rostrum, geno, isthmus, and splenium. It's a large body that connects both right and left hemispheres. Some people actually divide this into inferior geno, superior geno, posterior geno, and the body in the anterior, middle, and posterior, and so on. And most important are the connections. Here is the frontal connection, and this is the posterior connections. So it connects really the right side with the left side. And uh, some images from Broughton book about the uh, corpus callosum, and you can see the single gyrus is sitting on top of the corpus callosum and the forceps minor and forceps major of the corpus callosum. Not to forget that this is associated with superior and uh, first and second and third superior fasciculus and with the I4 forso and the arcuate uh, fasciculus. So we need to know this anatomy to really uh, know this corpus callosum. So the relationship of the corpus callosum with the cingulum and the severe guttural fasciculus. Back in 2017, Michael Shugru uh, stressed and uh, revisited the default mode network, uh, the functions of which are important, retrieving memories, recognizing others, internal thought, dick, daydreaming, planning for the future, motivation, and to reach goals. And this is made of the single gyrus, the medial prefrontal cortex, the medial temporal cortex, the precuneus, and the parietal cortex. Not to forget that single gyrus is very important, connecting us with papis uh, circuits and the head of the caudate, the dorsal and the ventral uh, single gyrus. So back to the question. Are these butterfly glomes operable or non-operable? Neurosurgeons are often taught that butterfly gliomas are inoperable. Why? Because there is a notion that we are fearing that patient will get out with severe complications. So most of the neurosurgeons in every country in the world, including Jordan, and I'm sure including China and other countries, they go for the simplest form, biopsy, following by radio and chemotherapy. This is an attitude I'm against. Attitude which is still going on that gliomas are deemed to die and just do the simple and send them for the therapy. So I think the person or the neurosurgeon who does the biopsy and not take as much as he can from the tumor safely, he is doing not justice for his patient. And the radiotherapist who accept to treat this uh, patient with biopsy with radiotherapy is also not doing justice for the patient. So they are afraid of akinetic mutism, of agulia, of injury to the head of codates, uh, receptor nuclei. Is not Can they manage it? Okay. So injury to the head of codates, septal nuclei, and the, the anterior cerebral branches are the uh, reasons why people are afraid of going for a section. I still believe that one should go for maximum resection. In a glioma other than corpus glioma, you should go for 85%. In, in a corpus glioma, up to 65%, 70%, followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy. But if you give radiotherapy for a large tumor, the patient is lost. He will not benefit. So let's go back to the days of Yazergi, saying that the extent of, extent of resection significantly improves survival. This is in the 70s and 80s. This is the tumor and this is the accession. Why should we not do the same in the 90s and in the current uh, period? Uh, Raymond Sawaya, in his paper, uh, found that there is influence of maximum safe resection of the glioblastoma. 20.7 versus 15.7. So aggressiveness of a treatment of gliomas, including butterfly gliomas, is important. Mitch Berger, in his paper also 2018, 39 cases, the section above 85%, 
um, they were um, uh, associated with improvement in the survival. 14 months versus three months. So why people are still going for biopsy and radiotherapy, I cannot comprehend. It defeats my intelligence. Also, Mitch Berger in his paper, uh, looking at the cases they were considered inoperable and he operated upon them. So aggressiveness of the extension of resection is associated with improvement in overall survival, be it a JBM in the temporal lobe or be it a JBM in the uh, corpus callosum. And this is the graph that he came with. You can see the resection, blue, there is a longer period of survival, while in biopsy it is short. Giovanni Brugge from Italy in a decayed brain cancer, surgery, surgery center, the maximal safe resection of all tumors is the standard of care, beta glioma or a meningioma. And this paper uh, also about the butterfly gliomas. If you do biopsy, survival 48 days, 18 chronotomies survival 265 days. What more evidence do we need? And also this paper from uh, 2008, major benefits of resection versus biopsy, nine accessions, seven point months, biopsies, two to eight months. And also this paper that an age is important factor for the uh, prognosis of uh, these flyovers. So age, Karnowski performance scale, genetic profile, and most importantly, is the extent of resection. So this is Karnowski performance scale, which we do for every patient with a brain tumor, beta glioma, or otherwise. We have to take care of these uh, markers, IDH1 and uh, MGMT. And uh, we know that the more extension you do, you give them the longer survival period. Uh, again, back to the paper by Mike, uh, Michael Sugru, the default mode network. Uh, he said, by doing surgery, you have to spare the cingulum. And he explained the way of doing this. And this is the corpus callosum. This is the cingulum. And these are the subseptal nuclei. So you can actually avoid going there, damage the cingulum gyrus. So you can excise without causing neurological deficits. As I said, Karnowski performance scale is done in every patient in our department. And I can show you some cases. Uh, this is a lady, 31-year-old lady, with this uh, JVM of the corpus callosum. And that's the extent of her section, and she survived for three years. Another patient with this bilateral JVM in the corpus callosum. Again, Karnowski performance scale was 70. We use the navigation. Both sides, you can see, we are going right and left, because I did really go both sides. So this is the still picture from the operation. I'm skipping the video because of sake of time. And this is the post-op, I've done a good, very good job. Of course, we send them for radium chemotherapy. And this is the patient post-op without any neurological deficits. And what really thrilled my heart is that this patient who survived the surgery, he lived to see his pregnant wife giving birth to his son. He enjoyed his son for 28 months. I think this is rewarding that we should stop doing these biopsies, send patients to radiotherapy. And it take time, if you do it properly, they can really survive. So in my conclusions, and I hope that I finished in the right time, the extent of resection is still the main factor determining the overall survival and the performance in all glioma subtypes, including the bilateral JBM of the corpus callosum. Despite previous classical teaching, which says don't, we have to stop this attitude. We have to stop the treating layers of people who are deemed to die now, to we'll stop doing biopsies and send the patient for the therapy. The therapist should stop accepting patients who have just biopsy because they know the radiotherapy is gonna be uh, not useful for their patients.
And this patient, this uh, some surveys of 48 months for patients who underwent biopsy only. So at least 65% of the uh, butterfly gliomas should be excised. Overall, improves overall survival. It improves progression-free survival. It improves long-term outcome. I do believe that uh, uh, the attitude should change around the world. Stop doing biopsies, especially for young surgeons. Go for good duxation and send them for the therapy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Sveil. Can I ask you one short question? Yes, you do. Do you usually operate this kind of butterfly glioma patient by by? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think Hirona is from the Chiba University. Yes, I am. Yeah, it's glad to see you. So thank you very much to help us to uh, to to do this uh, academic event. So I met a single in the Harvard University when I was a postdoc there. Actually, I worked with Shingo uh, in the same time, same lab. Dr. Danny Kikio is our uh, <coughs> our supervisor. So this uh, this project is also from the Dr. Danny Kikio's lab. The, and, I, and I think uh, Ken Tadeish in the Yokohama University also doing some similar work with, with me. I think you know uh, Kantadeish in, in Yokohama. Is it Dr. Hirono? I'm sorry, can you repeat again? Uh, I think you know Kantadeish. Uh, yes, I know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will start my presentation. My presentation is AD metabolism reprogram in glioblastoma. My name is Ming Li. This work was finished in the Mass General Hospital Department of Neurosurgery. And right now, I'm currently I'm working in the Department of Neurosurgery of Henan Provincial People's Hospital of Zhengzhou University. Actually, IDH mutant in glioma uh, uh, is is very common in low grade, nearly eighty percent. Actually, in the high grade GBM, only six percent. But uh, for the most of the com most of the common IDH mutation, IDH one is nearly 80, 90%. IDH mutant is very important for diagnostic biomarker and the prognostic biomarker and the predictive biomarker in glioma. So this is the following parts that I will present background and the six parts and acknowledgement. them. This is the workflow of the ND metabolism. From here, we can see if we block a number, we can see the ND level will decrease and the ATP will decrease and the cell will die. This work is published by the Cantalishi in Council Cell. Uh, his, his work shows the number inhibitor, uh, IDH mutant cell lines are very sensitive to a, a number inhibitor. And in the vivo also shows some good uh, survival. But there are some side effects. How to overcome the side effects? We think, uh, uh, especially systematic side effects. We think use the we think use the nanoparticle technologies. This work is published in PNAS by Ganesh. Uh, in the future, how to use this number inhibitor in the clinical? So we think if we firstly we initially use surgical biopsies, you then use the qPCR to test the IDH mutant. Then uh, after operation, there is a cavity. We can put the banana particles in the cavity. Uh, our particles were make, made by the MIT from the Koch Institute. And the uh, and, uh, so work in the MGG152 model shows some good survival. So there's a question, how does the number inhibitor modulate the immune micro environment? I think there are some several questions. Part one, immune. GBM model selection. There are several GBM models. I think PDL1 is a very important marker, so we choose the GL261. So uh, maybe uh, PDL1 is not a very high, not a very high low. Can number the inhibitor change the PDL1 level? So we, there are several uh, several tests. I think we use AND. We found that the AND uh, uh, level have the dose dependent, and the PDL1 also have the dose dependent with the number inhibitor. And they also have some time dependent. 
we use two ten point twenty five point twenty four twenty four hours and uh, forty eight hours. And uh, what's the mechanism to, to to explain this mechanism this phenomenon? So we use the we increase the NAD. So we use the NMN to increase the NAD, and NMN also can reverse the PDL one. So we 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 try to use this. Uh, mechanism to explain this one. And we use some human cells also show some good uh, results. Canomically changes the tumor immune microenvironment. We we ask a MIT group to make the, the new particle for us with the with the Kumar 6 uh, green green. <coughs> we, we found that this works very well. And the local treatment with the GMX particles in operating a PDL one in both tumor cells and the macrophage. So we use a double HC shows that some PDL one cells are from the nesting, some from the macrophages. GMX particles change T cell infiltration, and the GMX particles polarize tumor associated macrophage toward to M1 phenotype. So there's, is there some uh, some question? Is the uh, numt inhibitor cytosine to the tumor associated macrophage in vitro? So we have the we run new experiment. We we resect the GL two six one cells, GL six one tissues to dis dissociate and counter and treat. We use a different ten point and then get some good, good result. We found the numt inhibitor. Uh, have some certificate to the tumor cells and uh, macrophages. So, what's the effect of the between the two company two two com uh, number inhibitor with the anti PD one antibody? So, we ran the new experiment. We we found that uh, the nanoparticles uh, have a good result combined with the anti PD one. So, to some HC and uh, some uh, F. Uh, so, what's the mechanism for this one? When uh, in cantation work, we found that normally, if we block a number, ND level will decrease, and we think uh, artificial have is a reason. So, and uh, my work is also have the similar, similar, similar phenomena: block a number, ND level decrease, and the PDL1 increase. So there's a question, is there any connection between the autophagy and the PDL1? Here we use the autophagy uh, inhibitor 3MA. We use the Western blot to show that uh, autophagy inhibitor can partly reverse the uh, autophagy. And the uh, QPCR and the facts also show this similar phenomena that uh, artificial inhibitor can partly reverse that. So the final conclusion, number inhibitor can operate the pd one expression on GBM cells. Number inhibitor decrease the, increase the T cell infiltration and the macrophages. And the combination significantly increase the survival. Artificial may be the mechanism to Explain this uh, phenomenon. So next step, right now, we, our work, our group is working for the combination, the construct the new biofunction particles that have the NAMT inhibitor and the anti pd one The mechanism of PD1 operation on macrophages, the pathway is that uh, autophagy operate PD1. So thanks for the work uh, here. Thanks, thanks, Kairana. Thank you, Dr. I Ming, mean, uh, thank you for your high impressive lecture. So uh, are there any audience to have a uh, question to your presentation? Okay. No? Okay, you can you can ask a question. Okay. So Dr. Hiro, Dr. Hirono, do you have any question? Uh how do you think about the future plan? Uh, you talk a little bit about your future perspectives. Uh, could you give me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think uh, 
uh, as we all know, the IDH is very, IDH mutant is uh, nearly 80% of low grade GBM. So we develop this is very sensitive for IDH, IDH mutant gliomas. I think it's a translation now have a good, good risk, good prospect. Yeah, maybe we will, we try to run some clinical trials. Yeah, I think uh, Shingo knows something. Can Tadeshi also know? Yeah, I think you can talk in Japan about this question. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I always uh, talk with uh, uh, him. Uh, yeah. I think Nagashima is also doing some work. Uh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. So they are very well. <laughs> okay, so anyone? Okay, no question. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Zeda has uh, some emergency, so we, he can join uh, us in live, and uh, he was send us uh, the recorded message. Please, uh, Ming, start it. Hello, and I'd like to thank the WFNS Neuro-Oncology Committee for the opportunity to present our research from the University of Southern California and the USC Brain Tumor Center in Los Angeles. My name is Dr. Gabriel Zada. Here are my disclosures. And uh, recently, over the last decade, there have been uh, at what's described as an evolution in terms of optical imaging. And of course, we've had microscopes for many years and discovered several benefits of endoscopy over the last several decades, and most recently over the last decade, have seen many descriptions of exascopes. And the question exists whether there's a true evolution and what the roles for each of these are. For minimally invasive cranial surgery, uh, we like to categorize our approaches by pure intraventricular channel neuroendoscopy, which uh, is still performed through a neuroendoscope. This is used primarily for uh, hydrocephalus management and biopsies. Rarely will we uh, perform a colloid cyst operation uh, this way uh, any longer. We do quite a bit of endonasal skull-based surgery, and this is our uh, most common use of the endoscope. This video shows management of a Petrus apex and Meckel's cave uh, epidermoid tumor. We do a lot of keyhole approaches, either purely with the endoscope or with endoscopic assistance. And that's what I'll be talking about uh, quite a bit today is uh, the use of endoscopic assistance and the evolution in our practice with or without uh, port-based approaches, um, uh, which we use for deeper subcortical and intraventricular uh, lesions. This is a cavernous malformation of the third ventricle being removed via port-based uh, approach. Most of our endoscopic cases are endonasal, and you can see the uh, distribution of other cases there. And Whenever we are doing either an open or port-based, uh, especially uh, glial tumor, we will employ every modality possible to maintain the best balance of oncological resection and functional preservation. So this, of course, includes neuronavigation, nerv advanced imaging with functional MRI and diffusion tractography, motor and speech, uh, cortical mapping, subcortical motor mapping, awake craniotomy when needed, SSCP MEP monitoring, intraoperative ultrasound imaging with or without uh, micro bubble contrast, and of course, most recently, optical fluorescence, especially with 5 ALA. And that'll be what I uh, am focusing on uh, for most of this uh, talk. And uh, this uh, became apparent to us for, in a tumor such as this one uh, high grade glioma of the deep uh, frontal uh, white matter. And uh, we did this via a port-based approach coming from a, a frontal pole approach. Here's uh, passing the port in. And you'll soon see resection of this uh, necrotic tumor. Uh, uh, this patient did well without any motor or speech deficits. However, you'll notice in the cavity of the resection, um, uh, it becomes very difficult to tell where tumor is and, and normal white matter is. And of course, we use subcortical motor mapping here, but... Uh, advanced uh, visualization and fluorescence would be majorly beneficial in a case such as this one. And in the post-op MRI, you can see most of it was resected, but there was a small satellite lesion here. We still have um, gone over the 90% volumetric threshold, but it would be nice to see additional tumor in this deep-seated cavity. 
And of course, that's where optical fluorescence and 5-ALA uh, can show major benefit. Um, there was this nice study published by UCSF and Dr. Berger's group showing a potential benefit of a lighted suction instrument in deep cavities for identifying uh, glioma. And from that, we uh, began to routinely use a blue light endoscope, uh, which is a 30 degree angled endoscope, uh, which is uh, essentially for urologic or bladder surgery, repurposed uh, with IRB approval and off-label approval at our institution over the last uh, few years. And we've now published uh, two peer-reviewed papers in the Journal of Neurosurgery, as well as a, a variety of other papers. And essentially, the comparison has shown across the board uh, from a subjective operator standpoint that endoscopy offers increased fluorescence as compared to the surgical microscope for a variety of especially high-grade uh, gliomas. So just some example cases. Uh, this was a eloquent speech uh, region, high-grade glioma that came to the surface. Uh, this was done as an awake craniotomy. And uh, just a comparison here of the endoscope on the left and microscope on the right, you can see much more avid enhancement uh, and, and fluorescence. Uh, this area was mapped out and found to be safe and was in our surgical field. We've now resected um, the cortical part and proceed with uh, cortical debulking. You do not see a lot of fluorescence with the uh, microscope. Here we are using a side cutting aspirator and now you see a heads up comparison of the blue light endoscope compared to microscope, especially in the deeper cavity where we believe that the subventricular zone and possibly tumor stem cells reside. Uh, and so um, we, uh, we use this in conjunction with subcortical motor mapping and an angled endoscope uh, to really define the maximal resection possible from a functional standpoint. We use this uh, toggling of blue and white light until we feel that the tumor has been removed. And this was a gross total resection with neurological preservation. We think the benefits here are delivering the endoscope and light into the cavity and the use of angled uh, lenses to inspect deep cavities and walls which is a very similar principle to endonasal endoscopy in terms of delivering the illumination and panoramic visualization and angled lenses into the cavity. We now do our biopsies uh, using an endoscope via a very small nine millimeter outer diameter port. This was a butterfly glioma that um, we decided in conjunction with the patient not to resect, only to biopsy. We use a small port and blue light endoscope, and it's very obvious what is fluorescing and what is not. We have had a 100% pathological diagnostic rate when using this paradigm for suspected high-grade gliomas. And again, an, another example of, uh, of this schematic showing introduction of light into the cavity. Here's another uh, uh, occipital-based tumor that is rather far from the surface, about two or three centimeters deep. This is something we would do a port-based approach via a parietal occipital approach. And uh, let's look at this. And we try to come along the long axis of this tumor. So this is just the obvious tumor part where it's necrotic and uh, uh, essentially a non-eloquent area. But as we get down to the cavity, we advance the blue light endoscope through the port with an angled uh, lens, and we're able to see residual tumor along the cavity and wall that we could not otherwise observe. We slowly back the port out and continue this uh, uh, methodology until we feel that we've resected um, all fluorescing tumor possible, as long as it's functionally safe to do so from a mapping and otherwise um, anatomical standpoint. So this continues until we feel the entire tumor has been removed in this area, and you can see uh, the post-operative result shows a gross total resection of the enhancing tumor. Just a couple other uh, examples here. This was a difficult deep-seated interhemispheric high-grade glioma where uh, when comparing the microscope to endoscope, there was uh, no question that the endoscope with an angled view offered a view of this fluorescing tumor that the microscope did not. So here we did an, a small interhemispheric uh, craniotomy we're now doing our approach here, coming near the falks. We're doing some mapping uh, just to make sure we're not an eloquent uh, uh, leg region. And then you'll see a heads up comparison of the endoscope and microscope here. 
You don't see much fluorescence with the microscope, but with the angled endoscope, it's very clear where the tumor is. And then we proceed with surgical resection. Again, use of angled endoscopy to look around the corners and balancing this with subcortical motor mapping. And this proceeds until we feel the entire tumor is removed. As you can see here, there's no residual fluorescence and MRI showed a complete removal of this tumor. So this was our initial series of 30 patients with uh, a variety of microscopic to endoscopic or, or uh, ex, uh, exoscopic to endoscopic approaches, including some biopsies that was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery. And again, just showing um, some of these benefits here. And then most recently, we published our endoscopic assisted series, uh, which we called from white to blue light, showing that we now use an endoscope for high grade gliomas and intrinsic intraaxial tumors. So when looking back at this evolution, we, we use all of these interchangeably, microscope, endoscope, and exoscope, depending on the case, location, and pathology. In more recent years, we are now using um, an even more integrated uh, port, uh, which uh, is a disposable port by the Integra Corporation called the Aurora. The benefit of this is the camera is integrated into the port, so you do not need an exoscope or microscope. Just to show you how this works, um, this was a brain metastasis. This was the first case we did. Uh, this is a, essentially a, a, an iPhone camera that's repurposed for this purpose. And you can even dissect tumor away from these small uh, vessels and perform um, really a, a fine tumor micro dissection with this, uh, this product. And every time the port toggles, the image goes with it, which is the major benefit of this. So it's a rather seamless approach. Uh, so most recently, we tackled this case. This was a young woman with a recurrent high-grade glioma. They had approached it um, essentially near the motor strip, uh, which we wanted to avoid. We took um, a long-axis approach coming from a parietal occipital approach, uh, knowing that the motor fibers were pushed forward, and did this through the Aurora port with blue light assistance. So just to show the uh, show the case here. Uh, we used DTI, which did show that all the motor fibers, um, as expected, were pushed anteriorly, which gave us more confidence to approach this posteriorly. This is the Aurora uh, workflow, and we're just seeing the capsule of the tumor from a posterior approach. And then we proceed with debulking for um, quite a while, just internally debulking the tumor. We can toggle the port uh, to look from side to side, and we're working from medial to more lateral, where the more eloquent fibers are, are displaced. Now we're identifying the capsule here. We're dissecting the capsule off. We're removing big portions of the tumor. And of course, we're using subcortical motor mapping to tell us how safe we are and how close we get. Then we introduce the blue light endoscope into the port. And we can see that we have left some residual tumor on the wall in this deep-seated cavity. It's very avid fluorescence. We'll go ahead and resect that. Then we get our hemostasis. This patient was uh, neurologically uh, uh, intact after surgery without a changed exam and preservation of motor function. This was a near, uh, I'd say near total resection with a little bit of tumor left along the prior tract, which we avoided, but otherwise a complete removal of this tumor. She went home post-op day two in stable condition. And so uh, uh, our early experience suggests a benefit of a proximal source of blue light um, uh, fluorescence in the cavity. Um, uh, uh, we think the benefits of this are introduction of the light into the cavity and angled endoscopy, as well as panoramic visualization. This will, of course, require prospective multicenter validation to see if this uh, uh, lines up with increased uh, progression free or overall survival, which we have not demonstrated. But we do think that angled endoscopy may offer additional benefits, especially with fluorescence in for intrinsic brain tumors, which is essentially a new paradigm. With that, I'd like to thank the WFNS and all my colleagues there uh, for this um, a wonderful invitation uh, to speak. And uh, uh, well, thank you all again for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, both Zeda, for excellent presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he has an emergency, that's why he can answer our questions. And now we will shift to next speaker, uh, Professor Baskaya. Professor Baskaya is a well-known uh, brain surgeon and uh, uh, he don't need any uh, introduction. Please, uh, Professor Baskaya, start sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind invitation and introduction to surgery. I just add the ultra microsurgery. Why? 
microsurgery is important in glioma. So I treat the gliomas like AVMs or or meningiomas or acoustic neuromas. So I don't do anything different. And what is the goal of surgery in gliomas? Gross total resection. That means T2 flare signal changes in low-grade non-enhancing gliomas and contrast enhancing areas in high-grade enhancing tumors with resection of entire or some T2 if possible. And in some selected cases, if it, it can be done, supramarginal or supratotal resection. But while you are doing this, you should not cause any neurological deficits or deficits should be minimal uh, so patients can go through the adjunctive treatments. Uh, fa factors influencing the gross total resection in gliomas, of course, the location is number one, el eloquent cortex, eloquent location, deep location, and the surgeon also is important. And the advanced disease or the diffuse disease, that's also an uh, important factor. So uh, we have adjuncts and uh, we are adding more adjuncts every every time. Uh, Gabe presented very nice uh, uh, adjunct and using the endoscope and blue, blue line endoscope. So this is the ones we have here and most of the centers have. Uh, the important thing is intro MRI and where necessary, uh, uh, doing the neurophysiological monitoring, awake craniotomy and mapping and, and that kind of things. This is the case I use intro MRI, low grade glioma and awake surgery is right in front of the motor cortex. I wanna do my best, but same time, I wanna test myself. So intro MRI, we put the patient in intro MRI, looks beautiful, we close. If not, we go back and clean more if if we can safely this is the case you don't need intraoperative injunct you just need your anatomical knowledge this is no way close to the speech or motor so you do your good microsurgical resection and uh, today i'm gonna uh, show some cases uh, uh, of gliomas in insula thalamus or brainstem uh, the, uh, because of the time concerns so uh, I'll start with the insular gliomas. Insula is the island of rail, uh, a hidden uh, cortex under the temporal, parietal, and frontal opercula. Uh, and treatment alternatives traditionally until Yashari introduced the glioma surgery in insula, uh, these were all biopsied and radiated and, uh, and, and uh, didn't receive a, a proper surgical uh, uh, treatment. And still in some centers, people do uh, biopsy and radiation and chemotherapy. And some centers, they try to do debulking. But my goal is the gross total or at least near total resection in insular gliomas. When you are dealing with the gliomas in the insula, cerebral anatomy is extremely important, as well as vascular anatomy and the surgical techniques. And uh, I'm going to skip the anatomical parts, but the arteries, very important lenticular street arteries and the venous anatomy is extremely important and you need to respect these veins so you don't have an early congestion uh, in your dissection plates. Uh, my surgical technique is thermal craniotomy, general anesthesia. I don't do awake craniotomy or mapping in these cases because I do transsylvian approach to the insula, not transcortical. And, and unless there's an opercular involvement, I will I will skip those uh, 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 intraoperative monitor, uh, intraoperative mapping techniques. But I use motor evoke potential monitoring uh, to makes me feel good, and I'll keep going. And the subcortical stimulation, subcortical stimulation. I have done hundreds of them, but still I am learning, and I I think it overestimates, but I am using it. so. These, these, these things helps us to increase the extent of resection and increase the safety of surgery. But these adjuncts, they don't do the surgery. We are the surgeons, we do the surgery. So, and I apply the principle set by the Professor Yashargir. What are those? Wide sylvian dissection from ICA M uh, bifurcation all the way to the, uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, parietal opercula and and very uh, extensive uh, dissection of these arteries, skeletonizing them one by one, identifying the, the ones that supply the 
the, the tumor, then the ones that are on passan and long branches going to the going to the basal ganglia or coronal radiata. And while you are doing this, uh, uh, pre preserving and respecting all these veins, and then then it, everything comes uh, nicely, and you devascularize the tumor and you remove you remove. Uh, uh, these are the challenges in ciliary glioma surgeries. Uh, these are the potential complications. The most fearsome one is the lent, uh, uh, basal uh, uh, the capsule, internal capsule or coronal radiata infarcts. It can be very small, but the result will be devastating. This is uh, what well, first case example: fifty-six-year-old woman with this central core enhancing and then uh, T2 changes, surrounding T2 changes. Typical pure insular glioma without any opercular involvement and uh, craniotomy is the terminal craniotomy and we'll go past this and then exposing the sylvian fissure uh, from distal to proximal proximal to distal whichever one works in that in, the, in this particular case and preserving these sylvian veins uh, like i mentioned many many times is extremely important and micro technique uh, uh, like you are doing the MCA aneurysm or you are doing the AVM. And these arteries and two insular branches of the MCA will be it, within the tumor. So you need to you need to identify them and skeletonize them and they will be encased or engulfed by the tumor. Then go around it with the my, micro dissection techniques. This is the technique I use instead of self retaining retractor. I use tenor suture retraction. It's a temporary retraction, gentle. Once I increase my uh, dissection, there will be no need for this uh, retraction. And going around the veins, dissecting them and freeing them so we can apply uh, traction on these. And then now you see the tumor here, expanded insula actually, you see the two, uh, MCA branch uh, encased in the tumor. And going to the proximal if possible, if not debulking some, and then, uh, uh, then continue to dissection because sometimes mass effect doesn't allow you to perform the uh, micro dissection. So this is what I am doing after initial dissection, I am getting the samples, and this is the necrotic part of the tumor. And then I will go for further dissection. Principles are identifying these arteries, identifying the circular sulcus on the frontal side. That's what I am trying to I am trying to do right now. And also, also on the temple side. And then lastly, connecting circular sulcus posteriorly towards the parietal operculum. So uh, uh, I'll skip some some of these parts and uh, using the sonopet or ultrasonic aspirator is at the low setting. Uh, and if you use five or ten setting, uh, you can you can actually touch and remove the tumor from these arteries. It's not it's not gonna injure the artery. So I'm I'm going around and debulking and continuing the circumferential dissection until I see entire circular sulcus 360 degree and i am confident i got the whole tumor and when you come close to the basal ganglia basal ganglia will have a different appearance different structure it will look like little yellowish brownish with the white dots and you need you should be able to identify that if you cannot you can if you want to be sure, you can use subcortical stimulation. But like I said before, subcortical stimulation sometimes overestimates and and you cut your uh, resection short. We'll, we'll do the same on all aspects of the uh, circular sulcus until we get. I'm, I'm not only removing the uh, uh, contrast enhancing parts, I am removing the T2 flare changes. I am checking everything, making sure everything feels. I want to test myself how I did with the veins, especially. I know the arteries. One trick I, I use is the niprite solution. Uh, and then uh, these, these arteries get uh, dry and you can get a mechanical spasm. So this is immediate post-op. And it, it was unfortunately great for astrocytoma. And this patient survived more than four years. Uh, so this is the 
her last uh, progression-free survival. Uh, at four years and four and a half years, uh, he she had massive uh, uh, recurrence by hemispheric. Another one, uh, again, the uh, uh, this one is different. If you if you look at this tumor, will be close to the uh, uh, anterior perforated substance. And then I got a bad feeling about this tumor. I knew lenticular stress will will be encased uh, uh, by the tumor. So. Again, very short video, I'll go. And some of these veins you can mobilize. You, you have to pay attention to the venous anatomy. So I'm moving them away from my way so I don't injure them. And, and then finding them, uh, it's, it's going to be like I predicted, uh, uh, lenticular striates will be within the tumor. Um, but, so this is what I'm doing. These are the small feeders going to the tumor. I am taking one by one, like you are doing an AVM surgery and skeletonizing all these thrombos, arch thrombos, uh, 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 vessels of the GBM. And, and I go through the Limen Insula. I was able to go to the temple horn. You see the lenticular streets here. Uh, M1, bifurcation within the tumor. So I'm applying, I call this my fellows laugh at me, but I call this ultra microsurgery because you don't uh, you don't do this surgery until you mat mature your uh, uh, skills. Uh, uh, that requires time and they leave this part of the tumor. But when you think you mature your skills, go for it and and clean one by one because this is the patient's only time. You can do it. If you cannot do it, send somebody who can. So these are all cleaned and uh, gross total resection, great for uh, astrocytoma. Another one, very large one, previously biopsy, grade four. And you see is very large insular tumor, but it's pure insular and dominant insula. I don't need to do any, any uh, a, a, a mapping for this. I'll go for transylvian approach and gross total resection of the tumor as demonstrated in this postoperative MRI. And this patient has been around, uh, great for astrocytoma, radiated, but still around uh, uh, or, or more than three years right now. For some reason, insular high-grade gliomas, I cannot prove this with any da data, but they, they tend to survive longer than the other locations. Uh, this is my observation over 150 something insular high-grade glioma cases. You see ni nice gross total resection and giving the patient the best uh, survival. Another young patient, uh, this grade three, and uh, same approach, but this is more frontobasal, okay? There's insular component, yes, but more frontobasal. These are, uh, to me, easier than the pure insulars, and you can do gross total resection. And uh, unfortunately, it was grade three, but patient did very well. Now I'm jumping to do, for time concerns, thalamic gliomas, thalamus, another reason is neglected by us. Uh, we always worry about, if we do, we do a little bit uh, cavernomas, but we always try to avoid doing surgeries because of this complex anatomical uh, relationship of the thalamus and very important uh, 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 functions of the thalamus. There are so many approaches you can use, and I use almost all of them. And every case, I, I look at differently and try to find the best. Uh, uh, and soon, we're going to be publishing the uh, our thalamic glioma uh, series. So this is a 61-year-old. This is a this dominant thalamus, a unilateral. If it is unilateral, I will attack. If it is extensive bilateral, those cases, I, will, I won't do surgery. Uh, again, ipsilateral side down and going down to the uh, 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 lateral ventricle, hemorrhagic tumor, identifying the structures and debulking, preserving the normal anatomy and, and going for the pathological anatomy. Define the normal anatomy first, then define the pathological anatomy so you can do good microsurgical resection either gross total or near total realization. That should be the goal. Uh, we shouldn't be accepting anything less. And this is the gross total resection, great for astrocytoma. And 
he was hemiparatic before surgery and aphasic uh, and it remains same but after a week they get better okay dominant gliomas will have speech problems as well as weakness but they will get better as long as you didn't injure the internal capsule and another case, radiated pilostic astrocytoma start growing after 30 years, believe it or not. Same approach, uh, gross total resection, and he's cured. And another one, thalamic glioma, looks like a bilateral. It is not bilateral. If, if I show you the all angles of the uh, uh, MRI, it is unilateral with extension of this part, this part into the contralateral ventricle, but it is not bithalamic. And occipital interhemispheric approach is the best approach for this. And that's what we did. And mild hemiparesis, first post of day one, uh, improve over a, over a week. And this patient survived again, uh, I think uh, almost four years. And uh, after 39 months, uh, she's, she had the extensive uh, 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 recurrence, but at least, we gave her our best and she did very well and she received only radiation. She refused, refused to have the chemotherapy and she did everything she wanted to do in this life. So it's possible. And sometimes we do stage resection like this case. Uh, this boy is pilostic astrocytoma, uh, biopsied, radiated, and, and progressively he, he became hemiplegic, almost hemiplegic, arm completely plegic, face is plegic, and the lower extremity is enough to he can stand. But, uh, and then he was getting worse uh, after the radiation, in spite of the steroids, all that stuff. And uh, sorry, uh, we performed the surgery two stages because sometimes you cannot get, you cannot get, you wait, let the brain push your way. It's not gross total resection. You saw that there's a piece in the in the uh, near the capsule but this is six months after the after our surgery how improved he's he's going to play basketball now and uh, he, 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 he you don't subject this patient to unnecessary biopsies and radiation if you can remove you can remove another example for stage resection biopsy shunted uh, a, a six-year-old at outside facility in this case i did the transcortical resection because uh, uh, ventricles were shunted. There's no way I can use ventricles to enter, enter the tumor. So I had to go through the temporal, transcortical, transalkyl approach. But it, it, this is either gross total or near total resection. And I gave my best to this patient, okay? So I didn't subject him to do biopsy, radiation, and then they, they never do well. They became cushioning it. And, and this is post of day two. He went home. So uh, whatever you do is, is any glioma, any location is the surgery or ultra microsurgery, okay? And anatomy makes a big difference in these cases. You need to know the anatomy to how to enter these lesions. And we studied anatomy well, and we know, again, midbrain glioma in this case, and I use a trans a transcollicular approach. I didn't introduce this. This is Yonekawa's approach. He used in 14 patients, and this is what we got. And uh, patient can go home post-operative day four, okay? And people have the misconception that this patient will have a vertical gaze palsy. It, it, they may have initially, but it will get better. Another case, medullary tumor. And I mean, this is this is not technically challenging. You are doing like posterior foster fourth ventricle surgery, and you, you are removing this tumor and grade four astrocytoma has been with us uh, two years now without any tumor progression. So in conclusion, sorry for taking your time, you have to be proficient in neurosurgical techniques. If you continue to work, work in the lab, even if you are uh, age 55, 60, go to the lab, study, 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 study. You have to be versatile. Uh, uh, in these procedures. You cannot just go with one approach. And glioma surgery is ultra microsurgery. It is not you go there with the aspirator suction and then remove maximal safe resection, this maximum. No, it should be gross total resection if you can do. 
if you cannot do near total resection, and if you can do, it should be supra total resection. And go to the lab, study the anatomy. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Sorry for going over the time. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Baskaya, for this excellent presentation and the wisdom that you have uh, told us uh, today. Is there any question from uh, panelist or uh, podium? Okay, thank you, Say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and sound is loud and clear. Please go ahead. Perfect. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. It was a great talk, Dr. Pescai. I enjoyed uh, watching the tour de force of uh, microsurgery in very difficult locations for gliomas. Um, my talk is a little different. I'll be focusing on advances in surgical neuro-oncology, really from a translational perspective and kind of in, in improving iterations on how we can improve glioma care for our patients. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, a lot of slides to go through as well. Um, but we all know that, you know, glioblastoma outcomes really have not improved much over the last 25 years, really since this new protocol came out from this New England Journal of Medicine article in 2005. Um, and so really, as a neurosurgeon, as a scientist, and as anybody treating brain tumors, you really have to think about why are, how can we improve our patients? at every single step of the road. And, and I think the primary goal for all of us is to improve outcomes for our brain, uh, for our brain tumor patients. Uh, and really the first step of that is developing an infrastructure and developing some sort of system to follow our patients prospectively. And for us, you know, we started using Excel and moving to REDCap, um, but these are all databases you can use to prospectively follow your patients, follow their outcomes, figure out their molecular markers, and uh, and uh, uh, and track uh, which patients are doing well. Um, and a, a really integral part of that in having any type of brain tumor center is having a brain tumor bank. So if you're, if you're a surgeon operating on brain tumors, you should always bank prospectively all your brain tumor specimens so that we can go back uh, and figure out which patients did well. Patients who decide four years, five years after surgery, why are those patients doing better after surgery than, than uh, other patients? You know, what are the molecular markers? What are the mutations? Um, and you can see here, you know, at, at the University of Miami, we've been prospectively increasing the number of specimens um, that we've been um, banking every year. Uh, and this really re recapitulates the diversity of the South Florida um, uh, demographics. Um, but beyond just banking specimens, you got to think really outside the box. And this comes at every single point that the patient enters into the uh, hospital system. So patients come in uh, when they get imaging, their first diagnosis, you, you, you have preoperative planning, surgery, pathology, and radiation oncology. So I'm going to go over each one of these to see how we can kind of prospectively uh, and serially improve outcomes for our patients and kind of how we've approached it at the University of Miami. So the first aspect is really, you know, imaging. So, you know, conventional MRI is essentially the workhorse of neuro-oncology. Every time you get a patient who comes in with a brain tumor, you get this MRI that's done, this shows this contrast-enhancing lesion. But really, the utility of regular MRI really is really limited in contemporaneous neuro-oncology. Uh, we've been using the RAINO criteria for the last years and, and really it hasn't um, it has a poor diagnostic sensitivity and specificity especially for patients who undergo uh, radiation chemotherapy so how do you differentiate recurrent tumor uh, radiation necrosis um, and treatment effect so you know this is a problem that's really uh, plagued uh, neuro-oncologists um, and you know we've looked at the utility of MR perfusion uh, in gliomas and you know the sensitivity is around 60 to 70 percent so not you know you know three out of ten patients you know can have the wrong diagnoses uh, using MR perfusion uh, and so we also used uh, MR perfusion to look at the, how much if there's a direct correlation between the active tumor in these patients and you can see that as the MR perfusion values go up, the amount of active tumor fraction in these tumors uh, actually goes up as well. So there's a direct correlation using MR perfusion in that sense. But still, the sensitivity and specificity is not, not that great. Um, and so we looked at this from a kind of unbiased perspective. And you can see the MR spectroscopy really was the highest sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing tumor recurrence uh, in the post-treatment setting. So we developed a very interesting algorithm to do whole brain MR spectroscopy. Essentially, this is a novel uh, multi-voxel uh, MR spectroscopy algorithm to basically look at the whole brain metabolites. And you can see here there's heat maps and you're able to uh, predict tumor grade and IDH mutation uh, using this, uh, this system. And so this is a perspective case that uh, really shows you the uh, efficacy of this kind of tool. 
It's a 65 year old male with seizures. The patient had an open biopsy, had a kind of multifocal GBM, um, you know, got treatment and radiation to this uh, um, right temporal lesion uh, and was started on Avastin in, in November of 2018. Uh, and you can see the treatment, the, the tumors responded in that area. Uh, but this is the frontal area. So if you take a look at the frontal T1 and flare, there's really not much disease. But if you do a whole brain MR spectroscopy, you can see a, a, a blip of high choline NAA uh, on the contralateral side. This is in November of 2018. And as you watch this patient, you know, serially with MRIs, you can see in three months, you can see a blip of enhancement later. And then in six months, you can see fulminant disease in that area. So MR spectroscopy in this case predicted tumor recurrence distant from the actual tumor site. Uh, so this is a, the idea of metabolic imaging to kind of predict tumor uh, recurrence and guide surgical resection, targeted radiation early, and you can maybe even uh, predict treatment failure earlier than later using these kinds of techniques. So these are novel uh, algorithms that really should be employed um, to all of our brain tumor patients. Uh, preoperative planning, we all know, um, you know, there's advances in DTI and connectomics. Mike Ivan, one of my colleagues, is, uh, you know, um, piloting a uh, whole brain connectomic uh, paradigm to basically look at, you know, uh, eloquent and non-eloquent structures to see, uh, you know, best um, tumor approaches to basically preserve these uh, networks um, aside from our traditional, um, you know, uh, Broca's and Wernicke's areas. So these are important uh, kind of standards to include in your preoperative planning. Um, you know, surgery. So neurosurgical advances, you know, we're neurosurgeons here. Uh, what's, you know, what's the st status of um, resection? We know that the amount of uh, tumor we remove improves survival, you know, as we go from subtotal to gross total to now even super maximal resection. Uh, and this data was really based on Pat Kelly's work done, um, you know, three or four decades ago, suggesting that tumor cells were found two centimeters beyond the actual tumor itself. And so um, this was a work done by the Korean group suggesting that, you know, maximal safe resection through a super maximal resection really improved uh, outcomes. This is another, uh, this is a paper out of um, MD Anderson also showing similar outcomes. If you remove greater than 50% of the flare signal around the tumor, the patients did much better than patients who had uh, a, a gross total resection. So um, super total resection is definitely a, uh, a is now a paradigm shift uh, as Dr. Baskaya mentioned. Um, and you can see um, this is uh, uh, our work suggesting that patients with newly diagnosed GBM who underwent a supermaximal resection for essentially through a lobectomy approach had a, a, a much improved survival compared to patients who had gross total resection. And this was a kind of propensity match study. So we kind of uh, were able to um, uh, model a, a randomized control trial and demonstrate the improvement in survival after matching for KPS, age, and tumor type. So you can see the clear improvement in outcome after supermaximal resection of these tumors. Um, uh, again, improvement overall survival to 30 months compared to uh, 30, 14 months in patients who uh, underwent gross total resection. Uh, and this is really feasible through a very, very small incision. You can make an incision about the size of um, uh, about four, four centimeters. Uh, and actually uh, obtain a super maximal resection through uh, through this uh, through this corridor. This is all through this keyhole kind of approach. But really, super maximal resection is really not feasible. I mean, you saw earlier in the slides earlier that there was you know lesions in the brainstem, lesions in, in eloquent cortex. So how do you control for that? You know, away craniotomy is essential in the armamentarium of uh, brain tumor surgeons. There's recently a multi-center perspective study out of Europe suggesting that away craniotomy uh, improved outcomes compared to regular uh, regular uh, general anesthesia craniotomies um, significantly. This is a multi-center study published in Journal of Clinical uh, Investigation, um, so important uh, work that we looked at there. Um, but, um, you know, uh, can we do a radical supermaximal resection on the left-sided lesions? And so we also uh, sought to answer this question. And you can see in our mass cohort, supermaximal resection on left-sided dominant lesions also improves survival. So once again, taking an area of flare outside of the contrast-enhancing border improved outcomes for our brain tumor patients significantly. Uh, and obviously, you can do this with the sleep motor mapping. You can do this with intraoperative subcortical stimulation. Um, but there are other minimally invasive options for deep-seated brain tumor lesions. Not every single brain tumor tumor needs to have a surgical resection. Uh, and this is kind of controversial. But, um, you know, the, the idea of laser interstitial thermal therapy is becoming... Uh, Pretty uh, interesting. We've published uh, quite a bit in Miami about uh, the use of laser in brain tumors, uh, and we, you know, we initially looked at our first hundred patients and saw, well, you know, what are our outcomes? And you look at 
newly diagnosed glioblastoma, the overall survival was greater than 24 months. And this is really, a, uh, you know, only limited because of a lack of follow-up, but, you know, our outcomes are even better than that in some of our patients. Um, uh, and this is really due to the fact that, uh, you know, there is uh, definitely something interesting in, in terms of what the laser does with potentiating the immune response and uh, opening the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so, you know, deep butterfly lesions, un otherwise unresectable, uh, would undergo biopsy alone. Um, you can do biopsy laser ablation uh, and achieve cytoreduction and improve outcomes. And um, this is work done by the Wash U group, suggesting that the blood brain barrier is open up to six weeks after uh, laser ablation. Um, and really, this is uh, based on the idea that you're able to induce sublethal cell damage outside of the necrotic core. And this physiologic hyperthermia can really improve, you know, um, uh, uh, antigen presenting cells, release of heat shock proteins and activate natural killer cells. So, um, you know, this is a, a case example of a patient with a, you know, kind of peri Rolandic deep um, uh, GBM uh, patient, you know, maybe undergo, you know, undergo, you know, maximal safe resection potentially, um, uh, but, uh, you know, patient was presenting with some hemiparesis. We decided to do a laser ablation on this patient with a needle biopsy. Um, you can see here we got about a 93% ablation. These are the immediate post-operative scans. You can see the, the area of new contrast enhancement within the tumor, suggesting the tumor ablation. This is pre-op. This is three months post-op. Now she's you know on chemo radiation. 12 months, you can see the lesion has essentially disappeared. Now, two years later, there's really minimal disease in the corpus callosum. 48 months later, you can see there's actually you know the disease is actually regressed even more. So this is four years after laser ablation, IDH wild type, MGMT unmethylated, newly diagnosed GBM, only laser ablation. And at 50 months, she had a small foci of recurrence. That went, she underwent laser ablation again, and she's still alive to date. So this is just showing you the importance of, um, you know, uh, importance of, you know, kind of early treatment of these patients. Um, additionally, we show that these patients had a, uh, who had a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio that uh, is greater than seven, had improved outcomes. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, we, you know, we just sought to ask ourselves, is there any changes in the tumor microenvironment after laser? So, you know, if you, if you actually stain these cells and look for, you know, CD8 um, you know, lymphocytes, you can see preoperatively, there's really barely any CD8 lymphocytes, no PDL1 expression, and really no activated macrophages. So this is just uh, kind of the bland uh, tumor microenvironment in GBM. But as after laser ablation, you can see robust uh, uh, activation of CD8 lymphocytes, in, improved in, in PDO one expression and uh, activated macrophages all in the tumor. And this is a patient who underwent a repeat surgery. So that's why we have the tissue, but he actually survived nine years um, and still alive. He's actually doing marathons right now, a 75 year old with IDH wild type GBM. Um, so this is just kind of showing you the importance of potentiating immune response uh, after lit. Um, a lot of clinical trials going on. We use the ROSA. Um, you know, hair sparing is kind of an important aspect of brain tumor surgery, especially for patients who you know, are worried about how they look. Um, and, uh, you know, pathology, this is the next kind of frontier. Um, so you, traditionally patients are, you know, relying on frozen histopathology and permanent sections. This is a really a uh, burdensome approach. Um, we're starting to use the Raman uh, spectroscopy uh, through Invenio to kind of hopefully improve our uh, intraoperative tumor diagnoses. Um, we looked at this uh, intraoperatively and showed that we were able to reduce the time to diagnosis by 30 to 40 minutes uh, prospectively um, uh, compared to frozen section. So in real time, you're able to get a image of the brain tumor specimen and able to predict whether or not this is actually tumor or um, or normal brain. Uh, and this is all done with AI platforms. This is Todd Holland's work published in Nature Medicine. And this is kind of an example of that. This is the necrotic core of a large, you know, uh, left frontal tumor. And the enhanced edge here, this is the ring enhanced edge here uh, of the tumor. And the outer flare signal, you can see these glial cells still, you know, uh, in the outer edge of the tumor, suggesting that, you know, um, uh, tumor migration outside. But this is in real time. You can pull this up in less than one minute. You can see the uh, histology slides. And this is really useful for other types of tumors. This is central neurocytoma. You can see this kind of... Um, uh, pseudo rosettes, craniopharyngioma. You can see these crystals and cord this cordoma. You can see these. You know, you know, you can kind of make out these fibrociliferous cells. Um, but really, it's useful for a variety of other different types of tumors, and it's being now employed uh, in head and neck cancers as well. Um, and so, from a neurosurgeon, you know, outside of laser ablation, you got to think about other uh, options to conquer the blood-brain barrier. Um, intratumoral injection is now definitely an option. Uh, my lab focuses on viral oncology. Uh, we're very interested in using viruses and um, to target brain tumors.
tumors. Um, specifically, we're interested in looking at uh, replicating retroviruses. This is a, uh, a tocogen, which is a uh, which is a company that used a um, uh, retroviral vector to uh, bring gene therapy using cytosine deaminase to convert uh, five fluorocytosine to intratumoral five fluorouracil. Um, so this is kind of intracellular chemotherapy um, through a replicating retroviral vector. Uh, initial results demonstrated that you're able to improve CD8 infiltration in the tumor uh, quite well uh, with lesional regression. However, phase three studies really did not show any improvement in survival. Uh, now we've actually been able to identify a subpopulation of patients who actually benefited from, um, uh, from uh, treatment with viral therapy. So which patients are benefiting most and can we capitalize on these on patient heterogeneity to actually identify subsets of patients who benefit from retroviral therapy? So we're actually hopefully going to embark on a phase one trial soon uh, on this targeted population. Um, it's important to note and read the literature. So, you know, this is a recent study coming out of Nature Medicine in Japan, suggesting that intratumoral injection of oncolytic herpes virus improves survival um, significantly. This is now uh, um, in, in the armamentarium in Japan for uh, treatment of patients. Um, so, mean of survival for recurrent GBM was 20 months. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, uh, now there's ideas of intrathecal chemotherapy for leptomeningeal disease. Uh, and um, and really uh, now people, and especially in Maryland, are looking at focused ultrasound um, uh, to kind of improve the blood-brain barrier opening uh, and uh, potentiate chemotherapy uh, using focused ultrasound. Additionally, there's also targeted therapeutics. Um, so obviously you have to look at the molecular profile of these tumors um, and the multi-omics is kind of the centerpiece of GBM research now. Uh, we've looked at transcriptomic approaches. So taking the brain tumor specimen, looking at the entire brain tumor transcriptome uh, and seeing how can we reverse the genes that are expressed in that tumor specimen to make it more normal. And that reversal of gene expression score actually correlates to cell death uh, within the tumor and efficacy of different types of brain tumor treatments. Um, so we're able to show uh, that these treatments are positively correlate to improvement um, to uh, uh, efficacy in vitro. And basically, this is a kind of sets the, the paradigm for drug repurposing in GBM. And these also penetrate the blood brain barrier very well. So this is a very interesting paradigm to kind of look at personalized medicine from this approach. Um, and so, you know, you can validate these models by taking areas of the tumor and basically culturing them in your in your lab and testing the efficacy of these compounds in vitro, in vivo. Um, and really, uh, I just must stress before I finish this lecture that the current paradigm for GBM therapy really must shift. Um, and you have to think about improved delivery methods. You have to think about repeated injections, repeat surgeries, super maximal resection, in any way you can, you know, potentiate the blood brain barrier because you don't know which patients are going to respond uh, at this moment in time. And so I think that you have, we have to kind of understand you know, these, um, you know, the molecular phenotypes a little bit better before we, um, before we embark on uh, surgery. So uh, this is uh, thanks to my lab, uh, especially uh, all my lab members who've helped me out, my colleagues, a lot of this work was Rick Komatar, Mike Ivan, uh, Dr. Marcos, um, uh, Carolina Benjamin, a lot of my partners who have helped out um, collect these patients and uh, the residents for supporting us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Ashish, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. Is there any question from uh, faculty? Is there any question from uh, Podium? Okay, thank you. Thanks again, uh, Ashish, for excellent presentation. Hello? Samo, I have Hello. some question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for presentation, Dr. Shah. Yeah, I, I, I found that your, your research is very interesting, especially the LITT, continued microenvironment to increase the pd one Is there some, some, some original articles to combine RTT, RITT therapy combined with the anti pd one therapy? Yeah, there, there's two or three clinical trials. One's being done at University of Florida. Another one's being done at, at, in Cleveland. And another one's in Mount Sinai where they're actually doing laser interstitial thermal therapy plus checkpoint inhibition um, for recurrent GBM. <clears throat> and so those are being done right now. Uh, I, I, I think there are some other questions. Uh, how about the pd one therapy in, uh, in gliomers, glioma treatment in USA? Can you... Alessandra? So the yeah, oncologist, the, yeah. Uh, 
PDL1 or PD1 antibody can use in the clinical right now? Um, or, they, they, or they, they're off, yeah, they're not, they're, they're off, um, off label if you want to use them in, in, in the United States. And, you know, the Checkmate 143 trial was negative for PD1 inhibitors uh, for GBM. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think that it's all investigational currently. So, and, and also I found you, you are doing the, some virus, uh, your, your, your virus have some, because also my lab is also working on some virus. Yeah. Because, um, I'm, my postdoc training is, uh, Matusa lab in Massachusetts General Hospital. Yeah. Oh yeah. Marcus, yeah. 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 So is there some is there a difference between your your virus and uh, our, uh, for example, G uh, G G forty seven is a commercial right yeah. now in Japan. Yeah, is, yeah. This this some this virus is a uh, replicating retroviral vector uh, that uh, is gene therapy, so it's not directly oncolytic until you uh, until you actually give the prodrug. So it's it's non toxic until until the prodrug is delivered, and then the prodrug gets converted to intracellular kind of chemotherapy. So it's it's really um, it's a retrovirus, not a, not a herpes virus, uh, and so um, it's a, it's more of a gene therapy essentially um, compared to direct oncolytic. Uh, have you run some clinical trial about the you know, virus? Yeah, the the token. Yeah, the, the clinical trial, of the phase three trial uh, failed uh, uh, for our virus, uh, and so we're hopefully gonna. You know, but it, it was a beneficial in a subset of patients, so hopefully we can, you know, hopefully we can, you know, capitalize on those patients that actually benefited. The patients that, that did better were IDH mutant patients and patients who had anaplastic astrocytoma. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Ashish uh, Jensen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's okay now. And the sound uh, loud and the clear, and the clear. Please go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here this morning. Uh, my name is Carolina Benjamin. I'm uh, also an assistant uh, professor of neurosurgery at the University of Miami, along with Dr. Shah. Um, and I think one of the really um, great uh, things about this lineup is that it shows the how multidisciplinary glioma care has really become. And so, you know, Dr. Bashkaya gave this fantastic, and Dr. Uh, Zada gave this fantastic talk on, on the surgery and surgical adjuncts, and, and then Dr. Shah just gave excellent uh, talk on, on all the different clinical trials that are going on. And thankfully, you know, people have left one thing that we have not discussed about, you know, so um, there is a role for stereotactic radiosurgery in malignant glioma care, and that's what I'll be focusing on today. So um, I have no disclosures that are relevant, but I do want to uh, give a special thank you to Dr. Doug Konziolka, who I did my, uh, my radio surgery uh, fellowship with. And um, a lot of this work actually had, he pioneered um, during his post, uh, post-doc uh, clinical uh, and um, PhD studies. So, so as we just talked about, the therapeutic op options for high-grade gliomas really include an, an armamentarium of, of options. There's surgery, um, radiotherapy, um, brachytherapy, you know, you could talk about all these different things and chemotherapies. And now we, we're, we're just talking about viral vectors and all the different clinical trials with that. Yet still, um, you know, we are very limited in where we've, uh, where we've gotten, like Ashish mentioned. Um, and as we know, GBM extends way significantly beyond um, the imaging. Um, and and uh, Dr. Shah just mentioned, um, you know, the concept that the surrounding edema also contains uh, clonogenic tumor cells, and that's been proven by biopsy as well as cell culture. And finally, and I think Dr. Shah also mentioned a little bit about this, the metabolically active part of the tumor um, may not correspond with the contrast enhancing portion of the tumor. And that's something that we've now begun to um, explore a little bit further. So what's the current um, radiotherapy uh, sort of role in, in glioma care? Essentially, the RTOG and other studies have showed that 60 in, um, in 60 grays fractions and in, in two fraction and two gray fractions essentially is the standard dose. And the usual target is going to be the tumor plus this three centimeter. And this is based off of the Pat Kelly concept that, um, you know, it, it extends beyond two centimeters. Um, again, you can have accelerated regimens for elderly patients or debilitated patients, but this is sort of what you're looking at in terms of radiotherapy care. Um, and as we all know, um, the um, from the STUP protocol, and, and I think a, a, a lot of us have mentioned this, is obviously the benefit of concomitant um, chemotherapy along with radiotherapy. 
So what I'm going to focus on a little bit more is radio surgery. So what are the radiobiological issues when you're talking about um, glioma care? What's the criticism? Why not use uh, stereotactic radio surgery? Well, like we just talked about, if the tumor is invasive and it extends far beyond the margins of what we can see on the MRI, then perhaps the treatment, the a stereotactic um, radio surgery treatments can be too focused, right? That's one of the, the concepts that, that becomes problematic. Um, also, uh, the, you're only delivering radiation over one cell cycle. As we all know, um, phases G2 and the M cell cycle are the most radio sensitive because that's where the highest cell turnover rate is happening. And you're sort of, your radiation delivery is limited. You're not getting um, the, the most radio sensitive cycle. It's only one cycle at a time. And then finally, like we talked about, um, the imaging doesn't correlate with the tumor. The cell cycle thing, you know, it becomes really important because essentially we lose the ability to exploit the reoxygenation in the hypoxic cells. So, so if all of those are the limitations, then what is sort of the radiobiologic advantage? And this is a nice paper that talks about what the biology of radio surgery and, and how it applies to malignant brain, um, brain cancer care. So essentially one is the ability to limit tumor cell repopulation, right? Because you're creating this, um, um, this dose that's really meant to destroy the cells. And then the concept of the abscopal effect, right? The, the abscopal effect is essentially the ability to enhance tumor, um, anti-tumor immunity after irradiation. So you can contribute to anti-tumor immunological rejection at a distant uh, site. And that's the concept of um, those are sort of the radiobiological benefits of a stereotactic radiosurgery approach. So where did this where did this all come from? What was the rationale? And this is what I mean. Dr. Kanzioka really pioneered some of this in his um, studies. Um, these are preclinical studies using in vivo rat uh, malignant glioma models that have uh, demonstrated both tumorocytal and cytotoxic effects um, of single fraction single fraction focused radiation. Um, these uh, preclinical studies of the rat models, um, they had implanted C6 glioma cells in the right frontal brain region, and the rats were randomized to control groups and treatment groups with different radiation um, regimen. So the treatment groups included uh, patients that were treated with SRS to 35 gray fractions as over here. Um, they also had tumors that were treated with the hemibrain of 35 gray with a LINAC. Um, pa patients who had SRS plus whole brain radiation and partial brain radiation with 85 or single fraction um, partial brain radiation with 35 and one fraction. So all, or, all different uh, modalities of either uh, stereotactic alone or a stereotactic plus partial brain or whole brain. And what they saw here is that there was a statistically significant difference in, um, in the rats treated with some form of radiation. And all of the treatment groups, except for the uh, whole brain radiation group, had reduced tumor volume. So here's an example of that. Um, um, this is using a four millimeter gamma knife uh, col collimator. And this, um, this is an untreated tumor with a um, median survival of 22 days. And then here you go, 90 day survival after radio surgery with a reduced tumor volume. So this is sort of what, you know, where they were coming from, from a, um, concepts, and this is where the biological concept began. Um, and from a sort of looking at it more in depth, what this came down to was that the reduced tumor cell density and increased intratumoral edema was identified in rats that underwent SRS and SRS plus whole brain. So you can see here on a, on a cellular level, what's happening post radio surgery is that you're seeing more cell death. And in, interestingly, uh, uh, and not too surprisingly, you're seeing increased edema, but that becomes important clinically to us because you know, some of this edema that we're so concerned of or the pseudoprogression, you know, which is often seen as a, as a negative uh, component is actually expected and should, and should be a known um, sort of uh, consequence. And it actually should be a welcome consequence because it's showing you uh, treatment effect. So that's all from a, you know, cellular and, and in vivo models. How does that translate clinically? So these are some of the early studies. Again, uh, a lot of this uh, data was pioneered in, in Pittsburgh in, in the late 90s and showing some benefit. Um, you know, this is just the standard RTOG plus chemo, um, the RTOG, just regular radiotherapy, whereas if you're giving them uh, radio surgery and you see some improvement in median survival. 
So then, you know, uh, this, this, this sort of becoming an interest. So there were multi-centered randomized control trials demonstrating no benefit for upfront radio surgery, followed by uh, com um, conventional radiotherapy and carvesting comp compared with just conventional uh, radiotherapy and carvesting alone. So this is looking at are we, you know, at the timing? So are you giving it, if you give it up front along with the standard standard of care at the time, what is the benefit? Um, and it's important to know that this study was done before uh, Temodar, so this was before the STUDE protocol and before uh, Temodar became like the standard of care. So interestingly, um, a lot of these studies that were done really were showing that SRS wasn't really go upfront SRS is not gonna be, you know, uh, the, the way of using this and that really, Rather than using as um, upfront uh, treatment, what you're going to use SRS for is as a boost for residual or recurrent disease. And that's where the benefits started showing up. And this is another study showing that as well. So because the local recurrence became uh, was sort of the predominant pattern of failure in, in patients with GBMs, aggressive local salvage treatment is really important. So this is a matched cohort analysis in JNS in 2005 showing that um, rather than using it upfront, when you're using it really as an aggressive local therapy, when there's recurrence, there's some prolonged overall survival in patients who had good KPS score and limited volume of progressive disease. So the KPS score, obviously, as we know, is just an, an important um, uh, predictor of how patients are going to do. But important, the other very uh, relevant factor here is that um, you have to have a limited uh, volume in terms of what your um, recurrence volume is, because if you just have diffuse disease everywhere, obviously a focal radiosurgery is not going to be helpful in that in that way. Um, this there were other retrospective analyses demonstrating that gamma knife um, confers a survival benefit for patients with malignant gliomas, um, and this is when it was used prior to disease progression. Um, as part of their initial uh, treatment, um, and then when it's used in comparison with when it's when you have disease progression, right? So there's there are a lot of studies that are sort of suggesting that um, if you're sort of aggressive at the time of recurrence and you're ahead of the game, then perhaps that's when you get the most benefit in terms of progression through survival and overall survival. However, there really was uh, no prospective uh, randomized trial ever performed at this point to sort of test uh, radiosurgery as, as a benefit, as a, a potential treatment uh, for a boost. So then why consider radiosurgery for recurrent glioblastoma or an anaplastic astrocytoma? Is it because you have no other options, no useful chemotherapy? Do, do you sort of save it for the patients with the smaller tumor volume? Are you thinking of a palliation type of a, uh, effect? Are you thinking about the location? You know, location becomes very important. Um, or is it just because radiation is in fact effective um, to these tumors? And I think some important issues to consider is the dose, right? So in order for you to, to have a tumorcidal um, uh, effect, you want to really give as much dose as possible. And this is why actually the decreased or the limited tumor volume is very important. Um, and then your margin dose is sort of ranging between anywhere between 12 to 20 grays with, you know, the upper end of that being more effective. And then, you know, now, now we actually have studies looking at up, uh, single fraction radio surgery. What about hypofractionated? Um, well, upfront radiotherapy plus a boost at three months or you can just do radio surgery alone, right? So should should you be get, um, doing should you be sort of doing that radio surgical boost initially, or should you sort of be saving that uh, for your you know in your pocket of tricks to 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 save for later when you need um, when you have your loop running out of options and you need another trick up your sleeve? So that's another concept that you have to consider, right? Should you just waste what that trick right away, or should you save it? Um, other, other, other considerations is um, how do you make it the safest, right? So precise and conformal target delivery, which is why you, you can imagine, you can see why uh, stereotactic radio surgery would be beneficial for this because you really just can't get more conformal um, than that. Um, and then importantly, with malignant gliomas, as, as we saw um, on a cellular level, but this is important clinically, you're going to expect parenchymal enhancement and radiation effects. So you can't, you have to be able to manage that, right? Um, you have to, and, and that's sort of what it falls under the same number four consideration here, which is adverse radiation effect. You know, perhaps that edema is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Especially if it's in a location where you can tolerate it. Um, and then other and ways to manage it could be, you know, with, with 
corticosteroids if you need it, and, you know, if they're not on any other therapy that can prevent you from using corticosteroids, or, you know, if you need to you manage that um, sort of advanced of radiation effect with resection, that also becomes a possibility if it's in a resectable location. So can you repeat radiosurgery? So if it's yes, the answer is yes. Um, but if you uh, have a similar volume, you know, and, and you're repeating it to that same volume as opposed to a near satellite lesion, you're gonna expect even greater radiation effects and blood brain barrier disruption. So what it, where does the neurosurgeon come in for this? Obviously the frame placement, um, it's very important, you know, oftentimes we're the ones doing these resections and you have to be able to know what you have removed. Um, oftentimes we as neurosurgeons can predict where perhaps where you were limited in your resection due to, um, you know, maybe you got some neuromonitoring changes or maybe you were limited by location and therefore the tumor imaging and review and, and sort of a knowledge of where you may have um, progression in the future or recurrence. Um, dose planning, this should be done alongside with our radiation oncology colleagues, as well as the physicists. That's very important. Dose selection, and this becomes critical, right? So you want to um, be very uh, selective with your dose and you want to know exactly um, what your goal is. And if your goal really is to, to um, have you know, to a tumorocytal effect, you want to increase your dose as much as you can safely. Obviously, you're going to conform the, pro the, the proper setup, the completion, and all the post-op care. Um, and importantly, you know, in terms of the neurosurgeons, you're going to be the one dealing with the complications. So you have to know what has been done and what possible complications can arise and when to intervene versus when to tolerate, you know, some of that uh, blood-brain barrier disruption that we see. Um, import other important considerations. Um, what are what's the target, right? So, are we talking about the contrast enhancing tumor, the invasive tumor, the flare sequence? This is this is very controversial, um, and I think if we're thinking about recurrence or using it as a, a you know a tool for recurrent disease, then you're really going to be targeting that contrast enhancing nodules with the knowledge that you may have um, many of these pop up, and that if you do, you can do repeat radio surgery. For, for these patients who have already gone undergone the other options of the standard of care. Um, you know, so th this is another study out of Pittsburgh showing this is the, the pre-Avastin era. And I'll just show you just some case examples, you know, so the in this study, the margin dose range anywhere between 10 and 20 grays. Um, and the tumor volume, you know, can be variable again with better success in a significant manner um, in patients with lower tumor volumes. So th these patients all have undergone the standard uh, of treatment. You know, this person had an, um, a biopsy because of location um, and then underwent radiosurgery with, with good response. Again, you can see here, this person has undergone not only this, the standard treatment, but they've gone, undergone resection. And then you have this nodular area. Um, and this is questionable. Do you, do you, you know, do you just do the enhancing portion or do you do this whole cystic area? And this person got... Um, radio surgery to the whole cystic area. Um, th this is some example of um, the radio surgery response that you see, that breakage in the, in the blood brain barrier and that advanced radio necrosis type effect. So you can see here at the time of radio surgery, you know, some people at three months really get antsy and they want to intervene on an image that looks like this. And it kind of depends on how your patient's doing. You know, they're, they're worried that they're, there's concern here um, that's going to extend into the peduncle and that you're going to have significant effects. But if the patient is tolerating this okay, then perhaps you, you know, you can wait this out. And you can see here at six months that, that you get some improvement in that. And then at eight months, you get even more improvement. Um, uh, the radiation effects here, you can see that, uh, about, you know, 11 patients got some of the radiation effects that we talked about, and these are some other complications that can arise after radio surgery that you have to be cognizant of. Um, here, uh, post-radio surgery management, some patients do require recraniotomy. Some patients can undergo repeat radio surgery, and then, you know, whether or not new therapeutic options are, are available. I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, but these are some of the studies that show that, in fact, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery can be um, beneficial. And if you have a judicious selection of small target volumes, that's when you have the best results in terms of using it for recurrent GBMs or gliomas. Um, and here's another uh, study um, that shows the, a similar uh, improvel in survival and progression fee survival as well as overall survival with uh, low tumor volume and increased KPS being two things that really led to better outcomes. Um, so Avastin, uh, this, this is uh, 
very a new and very interesting data is coming out on this, but this is a retrospective analysis of 11 patients um, with recurrent GBM treated with gamma knife um, followed by Vastin. And in, in, interestingly, they see longer median progression-free overall survival as well as median survival compared with 44 case matched controls who underwent gamma life alone with, with Avastin. So again, you're seeing the synergistic effect. And the effect of Avastin here is gonna be not only in a, a, a direct effect on the VEGF expressing cells, but then you're also um, gonna decrease by, because you're decreasing the tumor vessel uh, permeability and interstitial pressure, you're gonna improve drug delivery, sort of similar to the uh, uh, ultrasound uh, uh, the use of ultrasound that Dr. Shah mentioned, and that you're also disrupting cancer stem cell vascular, the micro niche. So these are all benefits and how Avastin can act in a synergistic manner. Um, and then not only that, but um, the anti-angiogenic effect combined with re-irradiation also is an important way in which Avastin can, can help along with radiosurgery. So these are, this is some of the studies out of Pittsburgh that was, um, I'm not gonna go into too much uh, detail, but that was testing the use of concomitant Avastin. And you can see some um, results again, having um, after the first cycle of Avastin, you do expect to see that exaggerated uh, response, but over time, this does decrease. Um, and so uh, there's continued studies being done on the use of Avastin um, with stereotactic radiosurgery in recurrent GBMs as sort of a, a salvage mechanism. So in conclusion, there's a role for SRS and glioma care. I think it's important to know that this is in addition to th standard therapies. And um, this is after, you know, you've had recurrent um, volume and usually that recurrence has to be limited. The timing um, is controversial. Uh, do you use it as an upfront boost versus at the time of recurrence? Um, and the studies have shown that at the time of recurrence seems to be favorable. And then with malignant gliomas, we should expect this parenchymal enhancement and radiation effects and then it's important that we continue to study the synergistic effects of Avastin with stereotactic radiosurgery. And then other future concepts would be to target some of the peripheral flare and T2 volume, as well as some of the, um, uh, what Dr. Shaw was mentioning in terms of perhaps that um, perfusion imaging and, and using um, additional imaging techniques to really find our targets. And that's it. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Professor Carolina, for this excellent presentation. Is there any question from my panelist William? Go ahead, Ming. Uh, hello, Carolina. <laughs> Thank you for your great presentation. So uh, I don't know, is there protein therapy in your department? Protein. Protein therapy. Oh, protein. Protein syrup. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's a great question, and I think um, you know there's there are definitely studies uh, being done currently, clinical trials here here at our institution, even in Miami, um, using protons um, as sort of a salvage therapy as well. The protons, you know, they they confer a little bit of a different radiobiologic effect um, than than a single fraction SRS, um, and the reason for that is sort of what I mentioned in terms of the ability to to you know catch cells in different cell cycles and and the timing of it, right? Because your timing of protons is going to be over a long period of time, as opposed to uh, stereotactic uh, radiosurgery, which is going to be either in single fraction, or even if you're doing a hypofractionated stereotactic radiosurgery, you're still looking at a much shorter time period than you would be in proton therapy, which acts more of like the external brain um, therapy with okay. improve, improved safety. And, and, you know, some of the, pro, you know, in younger patients, um, protons are going are being used as upfront therapy, uh, you know, in, in sort of re replacement external of external bleeding. Mm. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Benjamin, for the excellent presentation and discussion. Thank and you, now everybody. we will get. Thank you. And now we will get uh, to the end of uh, this session. Uh, and I have uh, some words to say. We have gone so successful today for the virtual event uh, 56 of the EWNC Academy in collaboration with uh, Central uh, China Neo Oncology Committee.
Yes, uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam, for organizing this uh, great uh, conference. I think uh, this is the first. Uh, this is the first collaboration between the WFS and uh, with the uh, HPPH Department of Neurosurgery. I think it's good to try to do maybe next time. Yeah, I think right now in China, WeChat platform, there's uh, five thousand five hundred people are working just now. Yeah, thank you for your great. Uh, do you see Papa? Papa, do you see my screen? Sorry, do you see my screen, Meng? Do you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Yes, okay. Uh, this is uh, my own title, and uh, I am the man on charge in preparation uh, of uh, this um, excellent uh, collaboration with uh, our Chinese and uh, with uh, Ming and Henan. Uh, in a hospital, and uh, I uh, we have uh, con concepts and this collaboration regarding the scientific events, researches, and selected international colleagues for PhD. This was the first collaboration between uh, us, and it was done so successfully in June uh, 2022. Stop. Technical problem. I don't know. It's stuck again. Okay. Uh, whatever. We have uh, we have today uh, more than five thousand of our uh, colleges that have uh, attached us and uh, many international colleagues. Uh, by the way, this uh, this is uh, our collaboration too with uh, our international colleagues. You will find the records of our previous virtual events and EWNC Academy YouTube channel. And for sure, we are waiting for you to join our Central China New Oncology International Forum which we are collaborating between me and um, Ming Li. It's an initiative that have been above the form Chinese uh, New Surgical Society. I, ho I hope all of you will join us in this uh, uh, new oncology. Uh, thank you all for um, my chairman, uh, coordinator Kenan Arnauto and uh, uh, Professor Ton for helping me and uh, giving me support to put uh, this conference together. This is the last screenshot that I have gone from Medician. We have buzzed 5,000 uh, about from uh, our colleagues that have been followed on us on Zoom. Thank you and see you again and more, more uh, collaboration and scientific activities. Yeah, you can find you. me easily on Google, just to put my name and you'll find my, all my details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. See you all. See you.